From the editor, this story began back in 1975 when John Tomichel, then editor and publisher with Algony Press, met the author, who would become Jan Clement at a science education conference in southwestern Pennsylvania. According to interviews on the internet, John Tomichel paid the author $400 for the publication and all rights to the work. 600 copies were printed and advertised, and close to 100 copies were sold, and the excess copies were put in a landfill. Little known to the publisher and the editor, the book had circulated among Bigfoot enthusiasts and was frequently cited in works of that genre. The knowledge of this came about slowly. Thirty years had passed, and John Tomichel asked Algony Press to publish an anniversary edition. The man known as Jan Clement had passed on by then. Some material that was omitted from the first edition was added to the reprint. Among these were some sketches found with the papers of the deceased Jan Clement. The printing was completed, but only a print of 100 copies was agreed upon. John Tomichel took 10 copies for his personal use, and the other 90 copies sold out quickly. The book was never reprinted. When print-on-demand was developed, putting the creature on the Internet became feasible, and this permits the book to remain in print and eliminates stored inventories. Thus, we have the third printing of The Creature, Personal Experiences with Bigfoot. Sometimes the mind plays strange tricks upon us, and with the passage of time, we find it difficult to separate truth from fantasy. Time has passed, about two years to be exact, and I feel that I had better write down my story before it passes into that gray area of unreality. You who read this story can expect no great prose, no witticisms to tempt the chuckle bone, nothing to challenge the imagination. This will be a straightforward account of what happened. You may believe it, if you wish, or refuse to believe it. Your acceptance or rejection of this tale will have no effect on the future of the world or the future of yourself. I had built a cabin in a small wooded area in southwestern Pennsylvania. The land comprises about 11 acres and the property is in south-facing slope and a small stream and road separates this slope from another slope across the way. The other slope is rented and upon it a farmer raises cattle. His land is clear of brush and I can sit on the front porch of my cabin and occasionally see his cattle through the tree limbs and leaves. After I built the cabin, I began clearing a road and making other improvements on the property. This was to be my retreat from the world of teaching earth science. I am by nature an introvert, and the crush of large school classes and conversation with people leaves me physically exhausted. The cabin and wooded acreage were to be my bunker, protecting me against the outside world. The previous winter I had slept at the cabin in the silent months of January and February. It was a cold winter, the coldest on record for the county, and often the ground was covered with powdery snow. Sometimes the moon reflected a ghostly image on the snow, and the shadows of trees, and often as not, the snow would be melted, and the moonlight then played upon the decaying leaves and the dry grass of the woods. I was alone and would return to the cabin to sleep each night and embrace the silence of those woods. Here my mind played strange tricks, and in the moonlight I believed I saw shadows among the bare tree trunks, shadows which were watching me. I was not exactly living in the cabin by choice. I had committed an indiscretion the year before, and my wife Sally asked me to leave so that we could work out our desires and needs without distraction. In short, she had kicked me out. We would meet occasionally, and I would tell her about the ghostly watchers and the quiet of the winter nights. She would laugh and recite the stories of the watchers from the old New England poet's tales. I finally returned to live with her and my two children in the college town and forgot about the shadows of the night. I was once again consumed with teaching and the mundane matters of society and marriage. This adventure, which I'm about to relate, began in the evening on a hot August day. I had been digging a small pond by hand and the sweat rolled from me freely. I am so prone to digging ditches, holes, ponds, embankments and the like that I named the cabin area the Diggins. Anyway, after I had sweated enough and worked enough, my habits called for me to retire to the porch of the cabin and enjoy a beer. I had made my way up the slope to the cabin slower than usual since I was extremely tired that day. I went into the cabin, got a can of cold beer and went back to sit on the porch and relax. 
I took the beer, flipped open the can, and sat on the side of the porch with my feet up on a bench in front of me. I heard a slight noise to my right, and so I lifted myself and peered around the side of the cabin from the porch, and there, crouched before me, was a large, hairy creature. In an instant, the creature turned and leaped into the brush to the back of the cabin and was gone. I stood stunned. My God, I thought. I must have shouted it out loud. What to do? Shall I tell anyone? Whom can I trust? Did I want hundreds of people tramping down my property? Could I believe what I saw? A poet friend of mine from West Virginia told me of a story from his past. He was a boy growing up in Turtle Creek, Pennsylvania. He and a handful of louts were standing around a general store on a wintry day when a large snowy owl landed on an electric pole near the store. He said that every one of the boys, save he, ran home to get his gun. The first to return shot and killed the owl. My trouble was twofold. I did not want people around, and I did not want to see anything killed. I had given up hunting about ten years before, and even winced when I cut down trees to clear my road. Certainly I did not wish to see the creature harmed or killed. Even capture was against my personal feelings. I dislike going to the zoo and seeing animals in cages. The present system of building natural habitat for zoo animals somehow alleviates my distaste for the capture and public incarceration of wild animals. The argument that zoos protect certain species is a valid one. I was trained as a scientist, and if I had to, I would track the creature, if at all possible, and study it. I would keep the incident to myself, since anyone seeing Bigfoot-like creatures were portrayed as loonies by the news media. I take this method now to tell of my subsequent meetings with the creature and the events that followed. You may doubt me or believe me. Your opinion is of no consequence to me or to truth. The Second Sighting There were many grassy areas in the cleared patches of my woods, and often I would see these trampled down. My speculation was that deer were bedding in the area, although I had never seen deer except once in a situation which I will repeat later. I combed my property and the adjoining properties for signs of the creature, but could find none. I wanted to tell someone about it, but who would believe me, and what good would it do anyway? So I was alone in my search and extremely frustrated. Being alone has never bothered me, and I have always liked my own company. No one can get along without other people, so I would be remiss if I indicated otherwise. August passed, and September came along. Apples were ripe, and I would gather these and keep them in a basket, or put them out on my porch railing for the raccoons, or whatever it was that took them from the railing. It finally came to me that it may be the creature that took the apples. However, I did find both squirrel or raccoon tracks on the porch in wet weather. I had given up hope of ever seeing the creature again, and went back to digging the pond and sweating. I had made myself comfortable on the porch at dusk and was munching an apple when the creature appeared at the railing about eight feet from me. I had positioned myself in the middle of the porch to avoid looking into the low sun. The neck and head of the creature were above the railing and with a hairy arm it reached out, took two apples, stared at me, then turned and bounded into the bushes again. I rose slowly and walked to the edge of the porch and peered into the bushes. I lowered myself over the railing where the creature had appeared and walked toward the bushes, but the creature was not to be found. When I returned to the porch, I noted that the railing was over my head by an inch or so, and that was at least six feet high. Later measurement confirmed the height at six feet one inch. Estimating the size of the creature's head, it must have been seven feet tall. I was able to confirm this later, but I wish to relate the story to you exactly as I remember it. My first impression was that the creature was ape-like or man-like, about seven feet tall and covered with short brown hair. Its eyes were large and its mouth expressive. It did not have a large protruding jaw or excessively thick lips as artists' conceptions of ape-men usually have. The body was powerful with well-developed leg and shoulder muscles and sported a protruding stomach. A somewhat long, limp penis hung between his legs. The protruding stomach may seem normal when one considers apes and sees pictures of them, but when an artist conceives a human, the human is pictured as flat-stomached and muscular, which is a misconception. Stand on any street corner and you will observe that humans are flabby with protruding guts. 
The older the human, the more protruding the gut will be found. I can say this as I look down over my own creeping obesity. So you should not consider the creature as too much different than humans on that basis. For about a week thereafter, I set apples on the railing to no avail. I would set out two at a time and would not leave more than that overnight. Why should the creature want my apples when he could pick his own from any of the wild apple trees that abound in the area? The reason for the creature's appearance at my cabin escaped me. There was plenty of wild food in the surrounding environment. My wife Sally wondered what the hell I was up to and why I spent so much time out at the diggings. The tension, which was already high between us, intensified. I had become hooked on the creature and yet could not divulge my obsession. Can you imagine any man telling his suspicious wife that he was late because he was tracking a large hairy creature? I finally hit upon some of the ingredients of my meetings with the creature. I had parked my car down near the pond and not at the cabin. I had worked hard and had a good sweat, and I was on the porch. So my next move was to work up a good sweat and stay on the porch of the cabin. The system finally paid off, for on the September day of the autumnal equinox, I made friendly contact. I had a good sweat, the car was parked below the property, and I had my apple bait set out. My first impression was that the creature would not appear, for this was only the second day of my luring. As the sun began to set, I took a pencil and drew a line on the porch railing in an east-west direction for no other reason than I was a scientist and on the day of the equinox the sun always set in the west and I would always be able to observe the directions from my porch. As I turned about from my marking, I saw the creature standing about four feet from the porch. It stood still for a moment and then I made slight hand motions for the creature to come to me. I realized at once that this was not a human and hand motions meant nothing so I retrieved an apple from my side pocket and tossed it at the creature's feet. I was able to confirm again that it was indeed a male, its penis hanging limply in front, scarcely noticeable in the failing light. He picked up the apple, opened his mouth, and with one chomp crushed it in powerful jaws. I threw him another and another, and on the third apple I spoke in low hushed tones, increasing my volume to normal about the tenth apple. I was now fishing apples from the chip basket on the railing. The creature loaded most of these in his arms and walked to the bushes at the end of the small clearing and disappeared. The next evening he returned a little earlier and took apples from my hand, but would not really let me get near him. As long as the railing was between us, he was calm, and when I went to leave the porch, he would walk away and watch me over his shoulder. The reader might ask, was I not frightened? I can assure you that I was highly excited and frightened may not be the proper descriptive term. My temples were pounding, and I wondered if I was physically up to the excitement. I have always prided myself on not being afraid of anything, and this seemed to be a situation in which the creature was afraid, and I was the aggressor. I have traveled somewhat in Europe, and have slept amongst hostile gypsies in Hungary, and faced a knife point in an alley in Piccadilly Circus in London. When these adventures occurred to me, they seemed unreal, and as if they were happening to someone else, perhaps to my alter ego or some other psychological manifestation of my personality. It was and is this sense of unreality about life that makes me unafraid. Besides, I was a scientist, and this was a situation in which all true scientists wish to find themselves someday. The next month or so, I met the creature almost every evening. He would stay as long as I would, sitting or squatting, and observing me as I observed him. We ate food together, and I was able to touch him cautiously, and he would touch me. I brought other food to try out on him. He would eat bananas, pears, and plums, but not cherries and citrus fruits. Except for the plums, he would eat the seeds and all with great chomps and much juicing. At first he ate the bananas, peels, and all, and later he would peel them as he mimicked my behavior. My main preoccupation with the creature was to measure him, and if at all possible, photograph him. My preliminary measurements confirmed my estimate of seven feet tall. This was done by noting the height of his head as I lined him up with the side of the cabin. When I tried to take out a steel tape, he would run into the woods and would not return for a day or two. I got the same response when I left the car with my camera or a transistor radio. Photographing the creature would be difficult. 
However, I did not want to spook him and have him leave forever. After the first week of real contact, I decided to name the creature, since in our minds things without names do not register well. I had to name him, not only for my mental references, but in order to give him some recognizable personality and calling card. The only name that seemed to fit was King Kong, and this was ridiculous, but I settled on Kong for his large size and friendly approaches were reminiscent of the literary ape. So Kong now was his name, and I could begin attaching a personality to it. Kong's arms were about the size of my muscle at his wrists, and about 20 inches around at the muscle. His legs were perhaps 34 or 36 inches around at the crotch. The front muscles on the upper legs were well developed. His buttocks were shapeless and flat. Other than those features, he was well proportioned, much like a human without the long arm characteristics of the ape world. His feet were not large and about 13 inches in length, which is about an inch longer than mine. He would not qualify for the title of Bigfoot. He did not appear on rainy days or when the ground was very soft and wet, except for incidents which I will later relate. Eventually, I was able to find a footprint and make a plaster cast of it. However, it did not seem out of the ordinary. It was 13 and a half inches long and 5 inches wide. The toes were somewhat bulbous, with the little toe and the one next to it slightly shorter from the tip than the other three. I still have it stored under the cabin. In Bigfoot literature that relate cast measurements, the average foot length is 16 inches. Perhaps Kong was a youngster, and his feet had not reached their full size. As I had stated earlier, his hair was short, resembling a mohair couch and chair set we had at home when I was a lad. The hair was longer on the top of the head and under the arms at the pubic area and on his ankles. There was no hair on the palms of his hands, very short on his stomach, chest and face, and as far as I could tell, none on the soles of his feet. When I tried to lift his foot from the ground, he would not budge and would exert pressure on my shoulders or on top of my head with his hands. The pressure was very strong and I did not wish to contest it. Kong had a full set of upper and lower teeth and when he yawned, I was able to get a good look at them but was not able to count them. He wouldn't let me run my fingers over them. All of his teeth were even, that is, they came to an even row at their lower edge or biting surface. This was true of both upper and lower teeth. They were all flat at the cutting edge, as if they were all molars. I could identify the area of the canine teeth, but they seemed the same as the others. The front teeth were thinner and I suppose incisors. Generally his teeth were white, except he had stained them by eating berries or choke cherries. I could never understand why he would eat choke cherries and not domestic cherries. Anyway, his teeth seemed to be grinders and not cutters. His eyes were brown and quite large, with the iris perhaps three-quarters of an inch in diameter. He seemed to be bothered by sunlight and appeared only at dawn or dusk. At this time, the pupils of his eyes would occupy most of the iris. There was a noticeable body odor about him, much like that of a sweating horse or wet dog. When he would exercise, it would become quite rank and without my scientific curiosity, unbearable. No wonder he approached me only when I hadn't bathed, and at first when I had been drenched with sweat. His nose, which was covered with a fine light brown hair, was protruding with a slight bump just below the eyes. The nostrils were not inordinately large. Fine hair also covered his face just below the eyes, presenting a slight mask-like quality. His ears were slightly pointed and exhibited no lobes. I experimented with food, both wild and domestic. He would eat raw grain, corn, wheat, and oats. The prepared food which he took included white bread, rye bread, whole wheat bread, cornflakes, jelly, butter, margarine, honey, molasses, maple syrup, but not candy. I was hung up on edible wild foods when Kong came into my life, and so I was familiar enough with these to experiment. I would walk through the woods with Kong, following a few feet behind, and would pick up plants and hand them to him after taking a bite of them myself. He ate dandelions, dock, berries by the handful, choke cherries, lamb's quarters, trillium root, Indian cucumber root, wild mustard, pokeweed, and wild onion. Since most of this occurred in late October, most of the plants were old and not tender. I believe the mature pokeweed to be poisonous, but this seems to be an erroneous assumption. Kong loved spicy hot food. 
He ate the burning root of the jack in the pulpit without flinching. Any nature adventurer knows that the root of the jack in the pulpit is extremely hot and tortures the normal stomach. He did not flinch when I fed it to him without taking a bite myself. My first impression was that he might take the root and then never trust me again, but he loved it. He also ate wild onions with gusto. One of his favorite food plants was bed straw or goose grass, as it's sometimes called. If you're not familiar with the plant, it sends out long runners with rosettes of leaves around the stem at intervals. In the fall, it produces little balls that stick to clothing. Kong would eat these by rolling the long stems into a ball and pop them into his mouth in a great wad. He would chew vigorously while the juices of the plant and his spit would squirt out in all directions. In one eating period, he stripped away an area which I estimated to be nine square yards. In that area, there were other plants growing, and these he left in place. His dexterity in removing the bed straw was equal to that of the most careful gleaner of materials. I visualized him as a sorter of goods in some assembly line. One of the wild foods that I ate out of curiosity was the inner bark of some trees. I previously cut a few straight lines in the bark of a poplar tree when Kong was not around, because I knew that if I took out a hatchet or a knife in his presence, that would be the last I would see of him for several days. Anyway, I led him to the tree and pulled off the strips and skinned out the inner bark with my hand and popped a chunk into my mouth and handed a strip with the hard bark on to Kong. He grasped it and ran it across his mouth as if he were eating watermelon. When he finished, he tossed the hard bark away as one would do with a watermelon rind. With his fingernails, he pulled off another large slab of poplar bark and proceeded to eat the soft inner layer. On a few days, Kong appeared smelling strongly of wild onions. In this condition, I could barely stand him. He simply reeked. I noticed that when he did, that his eyes would take on a pink to red glow in the white areas. Let me state it another way. A few times, he came to me reeking of an odor resembling wild onions, and in this condition, his eyes were red or pink. I do not know that he was eating onions, or perhaps he had conjunctivitis, and this was an odor given off in that condition. People in Florida refer to Bigfoot as the skunk ape because of the odor identified by those who have been in contact with the creature. I would not use that term myself, but it is apt. My property did not have many evergreens, a few small hemlocks, white pines, and five small blue spruce, which I had purchased from the State Department of Agriculture. Kong ate the needles of these and almost completely stripped two small blue spruce trees as we stood beside them one morning. I tried to stop him, but as I grabbed his arm, he lifted it and sent me sprawling. He wasn't trying to hurt me, but merely wanted his arm free to get the spruce to his mouth. I knew the paltry food I offered could not support the body of such a huge creature, and his diet puzzled me. It was partially explained by the event, which I shall now relate. I will tell this story now, even though it occurred much later in time. It was evening, and Kong and I were squatting in front of the porch, staring at each other, when a young deer appeared off to the side of the cabin. It was the first one I had ever seen on my property. It spotted us and shot up the road toward the top of the hill. Kong leaped to his feet and was off like a flash of lightning. His speed was fantastic as he ran the deer down before it got more than a hundred feet away. He picked it up in his powerful hands and slammed it to the ground. I assume killing it instantly. Instead of returning to me, he put the deer under his arm and stalked off through the brush. I did not see him again for five days. I wondered about the deer and if he ate it. Like I mentioned previously, his teeth seemed to be molars, not incisors. After the incident with the deer, I saw him kill the following animals. Two chipmunks, an opossum, a dog, and a robin. The two chipmunks were captured near an old rotting log about 60 feet from the cabin. We happened to be in that area when one chipmunk appeared on top of the log. It stopped and looked at us and froze in its tracks. As Kong walked slowly toward it, the chipmunk gave out a large bird-like cheep and started to run along the edge of the log, which must have been about 20 feet long. Like a defensive back intercepting an open field runner, Kong sidestepped to the right and put out his right hand, stopping the chipmunk in its race along the log. The chipmunk reversed its field, but the other hand trapped it. As Kong held the chipmunk in his left hand, he reached down under the log and extracted the second chipmunk with his right hand. 
These he squeezed into numbness and then set them down, both small animals twitching near the log. I went over and I took a look at them and saw that they would soon be dead. When I returned the next evening, they were gone, and I assumed Kong took them with him. The opossum was an easy mark as it strolled between us as we squatted in the evening. The squatting in the poor light of the semi-darkness had such an aura of unreality that the opossum, which was the size of a large cat, seemed to fit right into the surroundings. It had a white bony face and a grey rumpled fur. In the fading light, it appeared as wearing a ghost mask as it moved slowly between us. Kong moved over to it and with a closed fist of his left hand knocked it over the head. He set the body of the animal out flat and stroked its rumpled fur with his hand. When he left, he took the carcass with him. The stroking of the fur was an act which puzzled me. What it meant is beyond my comprehension. Was it an act of kindness, or was it the feeling of an artistic accomplishment, and every out-of-place detail of the fur had to be righted? Did he feel a real companionship with the animal, or did he simply like the feeling of stroking the fur? In many primitive human tribes, there are rituals entered into which are the participants' way of thanking the gods for providing the food. In some human primitive tribes, it is believed that the animal itself has its own protective god and the harvester must appease the deity in order to assure a continued bounty. One other incident of this nature now occurs to me. A small rabbit had run up to Kong. Most rabbits come around in the evening in the spring, but this was autumn and not only were small rabbits a rarity, but this one seemed myopic as it ran right up to Kong. The giant picked it up and cuddled it in his left hand and stroked it with his right hand for a long time. He then set the animal down. It hopped around his feet for a few minutes and then bounded slowly into the underbrush. The dog incident seemed contrived. It was a medium-sized animal with whitish-yellow fur, and it approached us with much sniffing and barking. I thought that Kong would depart for the woods when the dog approached, but he stood there looking at me with a calm facial stare. I hollered at the dog and commanded it to leave. One thing I had learned about dogs is that you have to look them down or rather stare them down, like Daniel Boone and the bear. If you run, the barking dog is most likely to become a biting dog and attack. When the dog got within a few feet of us, Kong turned and started to move swiftly away with the dog growling at his heels. As if he had planned it, Kong wheeled about and with the edge of his hand caught the dog just below the ear. The dog flew about ten feet and was, of course, dead. Like all the other animals, the carcass was gone the next day. I didn't want to think about Kong deciding to flatten me with the edge of his hand. The robin just happened to land too close to Kong's head. He was such a part of the wilderness and environment, I can imagine people and animals moving right by him without even noticing him. The robin flew in and landed about two feet above Kong. He reached up quickly and caught the bird without difficulty. He then squeezed its neck with his index finger and thumb. I was worried that Kong might try human flesh, but this did not bother me after a while. He ate none of his food in front of me, and perhaps he did not eat it at all. Somehow, though, he supported his large bulk with what must have been an enormous amount of food. After the deer incident, I wondered if he had a family, and did he take the food to them? My efforts at tracking him were in vain, for he left no tracks or trails of any kind. I was fortunate on being able to make the cast that I did. No doubt about it, his favorite food was apples, and I could lure him in with a Macintosh or Yellow Delicious. I tried many times in vain to set up camera triggers to apples, but when the camera or any piece of equipment of that nature was anywhere near, he would not appear. When I pulled my metal comb from my pocket, he would disappear before it cleared the cloth. By the end of October, I was able to drive the car up to the cabin. When I would slam the door of the car, I would holler, Kong, food, and after a few minutes he would emerge if he was in the area. He would come to the vicinity of the car and stand beside it, towering over the car like some escapee from a Japanese science fiction film set. My car was a green Dodge Coronet station wagon with an electric operated rear window. The rear door opened from the top as well as from the side. I could place apples on the tailgate and he would take them, but he never got inside the wagon part. I was not clever enough to set up my camera and trip it, even though I sought advice from my camera nut colleague from San Francisco. Also, 
When I usually saw Kong, the light was bad, and once when I appeared with a flashlight bulb set up in the car, he never showed. I imagined he was somewhere in the brush watching me from a safe distance. When wife Sally was particularly edgy, which was quite frequently during this time, I would often feel I had to leave when Kong and I were enjoying staring at each other. At this time, he would follow me to the car and I would get in and drive away, leaving him behind with a stupefied expression which bothered me. I invited him into the car many times, but he wouldn't enter. Sometimes, as I began to drive away, he would hang on to the top of the car. Then I would get out and with much gesturing and hollering would send him whimpering into the woods in fright. Any time I wanted to get rid of him, I would wave my arms, jump up and down like a comedian imitating a karate expert, and shout loudly. Kong would scream and run away. The only voice sounds I ever heard him make were the whimpering and screaming. He also made a hissing sound, but it was not of vocal origin. Then there were also a kind of stomach rumble or murmur, which was more on the order of a giant cat purring. I did wish to tell someone about the creature, but whom could I trust? It was also necessary to have a companion to cover for me with Sally. My choice was Joe, the printer, a friend whom I occasionally beleaguered with confidences. I asked Joe to meet me one afternoon after work. This was in late October, and the turned leaves were beginning to fall. Joe arrived at the house in his car and transferred to my station wagon. I had purposely set up the meeting at a time when Joe would have just finished work and wouldn't have time to take a bath or clean up. Our conversation went along something like this. I opened with these remarks. What the hell did you take a bath for? You didn't have to. We're not going to a party, just out to the diggings to have a beer and for you to see the progress I'm making on the pond. I always shower after working in the print shop. I knocked off a little early so I could clean up. What the hell? Do you want me to go through life smelling like a horse? The conversation continued on that line all the way to the cabin. When we got there, I took a couple of apples I had on the back seat and stepped from the car, hollering, Kong, food. Joe stepped from the other side and asked if I felt all right, and maybe we should have stopped off at the local hospital. Kong did not appear. I reasoned that Joe smelled too good and that something should be done about it, and tried to get him to jog around the diggings with me, but he refused on the grounds that he was pudgy and not an athlete. He took a position on the picnic bench as I made a few rounds of the cabin. With each return into his view, I motioned for him to follow my lead, but he wasn't having any of it. I can still see his expression in my mind, him sitting there with his hands on his knees and looking at me in wonder. After all, he did work a full day at the print shop, and all I did was face a class of faceless students. Paper weighs a lot, and lifting reams and boxes of reams onto presses and off presses builds strong muscles. Joe estimated that he moved a minimum of four tons of paper a day during his busy season. Joe did agree to come over to the cow field and see the cows with me. He complained all the way down the hill and made light comments about however, since he was a boy, he always wanted to see cows and he missed being down on the farm. He went on like this and I mostly ignored what he was saying. We finally got to the barbed wire fence, which we climbed through, each holding the top wire for the other while clutching a can of beer. Once in the cow field, I led Joe through the areas with the most cow shit on the pretense that I was looking for mushrooms, besides trying to spot the farmer's prize bull, which was somewhere in the field. Joe was very dainty, and he missed every pile of manure. He kept complaining about the amount of manure and the smell, and I argued that we, in our civilized way, were not aware of the relationship we have with farm animals. Nobody stops to think that the hamburger comes from cows, and a cow on the hoof represents food on the table. He didn't buy my philosophy and continued to dodge the cow shit. Finally, I said to him, Look, you're going to think this is crazy, but would you mind stepping in cow shit with both feet? He agreed that this was crazy and that he wouldn't do it. I tried every ruse I could think of, including to throw him down in it if he didn't step into it, but he still didn't go along with my scheme. Even after I told him that I would buy him a case of beer, he refused. When I said please, and that I would do him a big favor, he still refused. After much promising of just about everything, he agreed to step into a pile of cow shit if I did so too. He did this gingerly with both feet and much mumbling. We walked across the road and back up to the cabin, 
both of us reeking of the smell of manure. When we got to the cabin area, I hollered once again, Kong, food, and I clapped my hands, which sometimes worked instead of hollering. Joe hollered into his cupped hands, What the hell is Kong food? Kong didn't show, and the sun was setting rapidly. I got Joe another beer, which he drank hurriedly, slopping it down his front. Let's get the hell out of here, he said. I've got to get back to the shop and get back to work. I tried to get him to stay around just a little while longer, but he refused and insisted on our leaving. I wiped my shoes in the grass and got into the car. Through the open window, I warned Joe to clean the cow shit off your shoes before getting back into my car. The only thing he kept mumbling on the way back was, You crazy son of a bitch. Discussions with Richard I tried discussing Bigfoot with my office partner Richard during those times, and he, not believing, would ask questions as well as express disbelief, and I would counter them. Sometimes I would ask a question, and he would try to come up with a logical explanation. His mind was not closed, but he wanted proof or facts of some kind. I really was testing him to see if he could be trusted, but on second thought, after exhausting my emotions with Joe, I decided not to share my secret with Richard. He would ask why we do not find skeletons of Bigfoot-type creatures lying about the forests of America. Anyone who knows the forest knows that dead creatures do not last long in nature. During the aftermath of resettling Indians on the reservations of the West, thousands of bison were slaughtered, and yet finding their bones is almost impossible, since scavengers and the regular processes of weather and decay take place. Richard said that wild men covered with hair have been part of the folklore of just about every human culture. The earliest written accounts of these creatures go back thousands of years. If it wasn't for the custom of embalming and burial practiced by most humans, there would be very little trace of the billions of humans that have existed through time. Perhaps the creatures, if they exist, bury their dead in sacred or secret places. Since there are hundreds of eyewitness accounts of Bigfoot, why hasn't some trigger-happy gun nut shot one for public viewing? I would never do that, and perhaps it is fortunate that hunters may consider the Bigfoot a human and not wish to kill a member of their own species. The state of Washington passed legislation making it illegal to kill a Sasquatch. The version of the law in Skamania County, Washington, sets a $10,000 fine for killing a Bigfoot. John Wycliffe, an English theologian once said, just because there are laws against witches doesn't mean that they exist. One may argue that it is foolish to enact legislation concerning some creature that may not exist. Well, I can attest that the creatures do exist, for I have been in contact with one of them. Cryptozoologists are scientists who study unknown or rare creatures. Some of them believe Bigfoot-type creatures to be descendants of an ape-like creature called Gigantopithecus that is presumed to be extinct. Fossilized remains indicate that Gigantopithecus may have stood 10 feet tall and weighed more than a thousand pounds. Extra-large human teeth have been unearthed in China. In all contacts with Sasquatch, the eyewitness account is that of a male. Why aren't there females or children? There is one eyewitness account in Washington of seeing a family of Sasquatch consisting of one male, one female, and a child. It only stands to reason that if Sasquatch exists, there must be female and children in the makeup. Otherwise, the species would not exist. The discussions with Richard go on. They seem to fear humans, and the usual story is that the creature beats a hasty retreat upon contact. It stands to reason that each animal species tries to protect its family and the male is the aggressor while the female stays in the home area with the young. The female and the young probably remain very well hidden in areas with almost no traffic. Can a group of remote people exist without ever being discovered? There are many instances that this can happen and unknown groups are appearing to what we call civilization every so often. Back in California around the end of the 19th century, the last surviving member of the Yahi tribe made their appearance. They had been living in a valley near Mount Laysan, undetected by their neighbors, who complained of thieves stealing grain and other foodstuffs during the night. It was a surprise in 1911 when the last surviving Yahi walked into the limelight and described his way of life. Ishi, as he was called, said that his people made camps, complete with campfires, 
and regularly raided the settled white communities and were never detected. Serious research of ape-like creatures have been intensified since the late 1950s. Although there have been hundreds of credible eyewitnesses, scientists claim that there is no documented evidence supporting the existence of these creatures. In 1884, a crew of train track workers in British Columbia claimed to have captured a young male Sasquatch, which they nicknamed Jacko. They put him in a makeshift pen and went to get the law. When they returned, Jacko had broken the side of the pen and escaped. The creature's existence in this part of North America can be traced through eyewitness accounts. The first published accounts were in Northern California and then in the Pacific Northwest. In 1964, there were many accounts of sightings in Michigan and Minnesota. At least a dozen residents of Monroe, Michigan, have given accounts of encountering a grunting, grasping giant animal of some sort. This was followed by reports of sightings in the cornfields of Iowa. People organized into large groups and scoured the areas for a sight of the monster. Many of them carried guns. No wonder they were never successful. You would have to be very quiet, probably exude no scent, and wait long hours in some secluded trail area before you would be successful in sighting. Certainly a large crowd discharging firearms wouldn't even stumble on a deer or a rabbit, which are creatures without large brain capacity. The literature is rife with stories of creatures that have been known to local inhabitants, but not the scientific world. Most of these were considered myths until they were finally documented by scientists. The Komodo dragon was considered a myth and legend until it was actually chronicled. The same can be said of the African okapi and a host of other creatures. Stories of animals thought to be extinct and then turning up abound in the annals of paleontology. The large mountain gorillas of the African highlands were not discovered by Europeans until 1918, even though the British, French, Germans, Dutch, Belgians, Portuguese and Spanish had colonies there for over 200 years. One of the most famous events concerning Bigfoot occurred at Bluff Creek, California in 1967. During a Bigfoot expedition, Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin shot a short film of a running hair-covered creature. Most scientists believe the Patterson film, as it came to be known, is a hoax. However, many believe the film is genuine. I am with the hoax group since there are many aspects of the film that seem inconsistent with my experiences with Kong. Slavomir Razwise, hero of the true adventure The Long Walk, described in great detail his group's account of encountering Yeti in the snowy Himalayas. No Yeti has so far been shot or captured, although hundreds of eyewitness accounts have been documented. Razwise's account differs greatly from other eyewitness accounts of Yeti, since his sighting was a very large creature, while other Yeti sightings describe the creature as short in stature. There was nothing to indicate an embellishment of the sighting, since the theme of the book was the escape from captivity and the journey to safety. The Yeti incident was a side issue, since the creature blocked their descent from the mountain. I wanted to tell Richard and invite him out to see if Kong would appear, but I just couldn't do it. I thought perhaps at a later time, after I had a chance to feel Richard out further, it could be done. To my surprise one day, Richard came in with a Xerox copy of two articles he had gleaned from some source that he identified only as an occult book. The material appears below in somewhat edited form. The first article concerned a story out of Knox County, Tennessee, where in September 1959, a hideous monster was observed peering through a window at a house on Mount Olive Church Road. The occupant, Merle Turner, described the creature as nearly 10 feet tall and huge in bulk. After this event, Turner, along with one of his neighbors, would sit out at night. They would not speak to each other. The only sound they made was that of the neighbor spitting from his tobacco chaw. Sure enough, the monster returned, and Turner was able to get a couple of shots off from his 30-30 rifle. He heard the monster scream, but it didn't fall. When daylight appeared, they could find no trace of blood or hair. In that same area, there were reports of some animal bothering chickens and rummaging through a garbage dump in the early dark hours of evening. There were many tracks discovered with this observation, but none were made into casts. People who claimed to have seen the prowler used the words horrible and gorilla to describe it. 
The second article referred to two 17-year-old boys living near Mount Hood in the Cascades who observed a hairy giant two times over a period of one week in 1960. They had a gun with them on the second sighting and went racing through the woods after the beast. They said they got off four shots at the hairy ape and think they might have hit it. They reported footprints with five toes and no appearance of claws. They accompanied a local sheriff to the area but could not find the footprints. When I read these articles, my mind was made up that indeed I would keep the presence of Kong to myself. However, I did trust Richard and would think about getting him out at a later date. Richard was an avid deer and bear hunter, and this mentality would have to be taken into consideration. If there is one humorous aspect of the American scene, it is that of rural law enforcement agencies. The township officers of the Diggins area were not different in this respect, and all of them may have been movie characters with a little coaching. If a criminal was ever apprehended in our township, it was mostly by accident rather than on purpose. I worried that the police might come across Kong since they were to keep an eye on the place for me. I had had three burglaries up to the time I met Kong. At this writing, there are now four burglaries. When I seriously reflected on the police running into Kong, I know that it was out of question since they spent most of their time hot-rodding in the township car and drinking coffee in the only coffee shop of the area. Each time the place was burglarized, I dutifully reported it to the police who came out after a day or two to list the items taken. The township police had an unlisted number and the only way a citizen could get them was to call the county police who would contact the township police. Then the township police would contact me and we would agree to meet out at the cabin and we would compile the list of loot. I missed such trite items as canned food, knives, spoons, bedding, pictures from the walls and half-broken tools. Once they did get a good hatchet and an old working TV set from me as well as two half-working radios. The investigating officers consisted of a part-time officer who was partly on welfare and who was once convicted of stripping a stolen car prior to being hired. The other was a full-time officer who had nine children and who had supplemented his income with welfare also. No wonder police are open to graft. I have always had the sneaking suspicion that the police were somehow involved with the burglaries. For some reason, the burglars never took an antique tavern sign I had which pictured a horse, rider, and the message, Traveler's Rest, 1762, Entertainment for Man and Beast. The first time the police arrived, the younger wondered the same thing. On the next investigation, he said that they didn't get that sign yet, and on the third, he suggested that I take the sign out of the cabin. Stolen and stripped cars were always turning up around the cabin area, but only twice on my property. The hulks of the cars would lie around for about a month, and finally the township would send out a crew to remove the carcasses. Nothing about the cars or the burglaries ever appeared in the Tri-County newspaper, although crimes in the other areas were dutifully reported. Aside from the burglaries, the area of the diggings was constantly bombarded with litter at the road entrance. One weekend, I counted 11 different brands of beer from the cans and bottles strewn about. People often stopped by the spring area to wash their cars and load up plastic jugs with spring water. The area was deluged with an array of paper napkins from Winkies and the Dairy Queen. Empty pizza cartons were piled up each weekend as if they were sold at an establishment near the spring. Plastic jugs littered the ground. About every two weeks in summer, I would gather this debris and build a fire with them. The cans and bottles I would take to the diggings and throw into a hole that I dug for the purpose. On one occasion, I had a fire going by the spring and was burning debris when a middle-aged couple with a teenage daughter stopped and filled up their plastic jugs with water. As they got into their car, ready to leave, the daughter threw a paper bag out the window into the spring. They drove away without speaking to me, and I hollered, Litterbug, after them. It was a constant battle with these litterbugs. I once put a sign, If you continue to litter, I will destroy this spring, beside the pipe outlet for the water. Thinking myself clever, I signed it, The Troll, since in mythology all springs were guarded by trolls. This didn't work. This was followed by another sign, Pigs leave litter, but this too made no impression. I tried to get the township health department to post no dumping health department signs, but their promises were never fulfilled. 
I was probably considered a nuisance by the township commissioners. I had my property posted with no hunting signs, but this didn't stop trespassers, and so I switched signs to include all trespassers. Even though the diggings was off the beaten path, there was a steady flow of traffic on the road on weekends. I once came across a man in a sports car, sighting his rifle up into the cow field and adjusting the scope. His wife sat calmly in the driver's seat. I'm not sure if it was his wife, but that identification is close enough for my purposes here. As I pulled up alongside of him, I asked him what he was doing, and he answered that there was something moving up there in the field. This was before I met Kong. I assured the man that I was glad it wasn't me up there as he fired two quick rounds. I asked him what it was he shot, and he answered that he didn't know for sure, but it got away. He ran around to the passenger seat, got in, and they drove away. I walked up into the field, but could see nothing. Except for the weekend traffic, there was not much activity along the roads except for people dropping off trash, most of which was done by moonlight. However, one day, as I was cleaning out my ditch, a beat-up pickup truck bearing three men appeared. The man in the end passenger seat said, Hey, I did your roof. I ignored him. He said, I'm talking to you. Come here. Being courteous, I went over to him. This, too, was a couple of months before I met Kong. The three occupants were dark-skinned, but not members of the black community. The driver was an older, portly man, about 60. The thin man in the middle appeared to be in his early 20s, and the round, stocky man talking to me was in his early 20s. The stocky man said, Look in the back, which I did. He said, we just got finished with a job and we have some tar left over and we can use it up on your roof for $14. The men did not seem to be from the local area. A small rug hung from the back of the truck covering their license plate. I pondered the situation and figured it would give me another three or four years of wear if I had the rolled tar paper coated, so I said, okay. They drove up to the cabin and immediately the skinny guy got on the roof and the stout one handed him a hose from the vat of tar on the back of the truck and started the pump. The skinny guy moved around, then laughed and said something like, uh-oh, in a foreign language. The stout fellow said something back to him, and if I had to interpret it, the words were something like, keep going anyway. The older fellow kept moving behind me as I watched them. It gave me an eerie feeling. He asked me if there was anyone in the cabin, and foolishly I said there wasn't. He said he wanted to take a leak and didn't want to embarrass anyone, but he kept standing behind me. I said I would get my wallet, which was in the car, and pay them. When I checked my wallet, I found I only had $11, and I said that to the stout fellow. I told him I would give him a check for the $3. He said, wait a while, there is a misunderstanding. It was $14 a gallon, and they have already used up about three gallons of tar on the roof. Sometimes my stupidity knows no bounds. I knew that I had been had, and this was a group of con artists. I had recently read about gypsies being in the area, using confidence tricks. The older man moved behind me again. I explained that all I had was $11, and they were to stop work immediately. The stout man said okay, and he would accept the $11 on condition I didn't contact the police or put them in a bad light. I mumbled something about being sorry about the misunderstanding, and it was my error. The older man asked if I had any fishing equipment in the cabin, and could they borrow it to fish in my small pond, since he saw some large fish near the surface when they drove up. I said I didn't have any fishing equipment, and the stout fellow said, Please, it would help us a lot if we could catch some fish for our dinner. Again, I said I didn't have any kind of fishing equipment. Their demeanor had changed from one of toughness to one of pleading. They did, however, have $11 of my money in their pocket, and I probably had a hole in my roof. They left, and after a few minutes to calm my nerves, I headed for home. A few days later, I told the story to my colleague Bill, who said that I was to consider myself lucky, since I wasn't assaulted, stabbed, or had my throat cut. On one of the occasions when I reported the stripping of a car, the police investigation had been a week in coming. During the course of the examination, the older policeman found a rear-view mirror on the ground near the car. Apparently, the strippers had dropped it. The mirror was put into the back seat of the squad car. The squad car itself was a piece of junk. I believe it was an old Oldsmobile, which didn't appear to be able to reach 50 miles an hour going downhill. Anyway, this was the law with which I had to contend, and on which I had to depend. I mentioned the gypsies, 
but got no response. It was not unusual to come to the cabin and find that the putty from a window was slowly being removed or that the door lock was being jimmied with sharp instruments. The stripping around the doors was often pried away from the frame. Anything lying loose around the cabin would be removed if it lay there for two weeks. Nothing was safe. Even my wheelbarrow was taken. Another danger that was posed was that of arson. Shortly after I met Kong, there were several burnings in the township area of the diggings. These were obviously arson, and the time of the fires was early in the morning. It was startling to be driving on the main road towards the property and see the remains of a burnt-out barn smoldering, a barn that had stood the day before. My closest neighbor thought that it was the work of the junior firemen of the area. They were an active group in their early twenties and late teens, and the neighbor believed that they started the fires to get some practice in firefighting, and the sight of flames gave them a psychological high. If this was the case, then they really needed to practice, since most of the buildings burned to the ground. The buildings were mostly garages, barns, and unoccupied old houses. How the Diggins escaped this, I don't know. But even as I write these lines, I expect that someone may be out there trying to put a torch to the place. I once found a pack of burned-out matches and an empty six-pack of beer under the porch of the cabin. I don't know if this was an attempt to set the cabin on fire or not, since it would be an easy thing to do. I keep wood stacked under it, and any light would send it up in smoke. When I brought this to the attention of the police, all the old officer could say was, probably some kids fooling around. The highlight of my war with the litterbugs, trespassers, and burglars came when I found an old car door about ten feet up the road into the Diggins' property. It was painted pink and had a Bugs Bunny decal in the middle of it. Ha ha, thought I, now at last I have them. I went to the township building, which was about ten miles away, and sought out the notorious local constable, whom I had never met. The two township police officers were a comedy team, but the constable was the master. He was a tall, portly fellow with graying hair and an odor of stale cigarettes about him. The whiskey smell coming from him offset the tobacco odor nicely. He was usually holed up in the township building, talking to the grading equipment driver, who never seemed to be out on duty. It was a slow and easy way of life, and nothing rattled him too much. Dog violations were his specialty. I believe that even in his lethargic state, the constable would have noticed the owner of a pink car with a Bugs Bunny decal on it. When I presented him with the evidence, all he could say was, Hell, there must be at least a dozen cars like that around here. I gave up and decided to protect my property by being there often and policing the grounds for litter myself. On one occasion, I found five trash bags full of litter dumped along the banks of the little stream which fed the pond. These were too much to bury in my hole, so I opened up one of them and found several envelopes with the same address on them. I wrote to the address and gave the litter bug two weeks to clean up the mess he dumped, or I would turn my information over to the police. Although not many people feared our rural police, the litter was gone in the allotted period of time. I tried to communicate with Kong from the very beginning of our association. He and I would most likely just stare into each other's face for hours at a time. He seemed incapable of speech, or speech-like sounds other than screeching or giving a soft whimper. Once when I tried to move his mouth to form words, he inadvertently bit my finger and it bled fiercely. I remember whipping my finger out of his mouth and the blood splattering against the side of the cabin. It was my right index finger and the damage was in the middle of the middle joint. I soaked it in scotch whiskey, which burned. I considered getting a tetanus shot or checking to see if I needed stitches, but it had bled so much I considered this unnecessary. I remember cursing and yelling at Kong, but he just looked at me with a stupid quizzical expression. Yelling at Kong made no impression on him, but if I yelled and waved my arms and jumped up and down, he would get nervous and back away. I could always get him to back off by jumping up and down and yelling. In fact, by jumping up and down and yelling, I could get most any person or animal to back off quickly. As to the cabin, Kong never set foot on the porch, which was the only way to easily enter. One could enter through the back door, but I kept that bolted and locked and only used the front entrance from the porch. If I could not get Kong on the porch, then of course he never entered the place. He would peer through a window at me or take things from the porch railing, but never would step on or into the place. 
In about three weeks, I taught him some commands that seemed to be necessary. He learned to stay by my making threatening gestures and holding him with repetition of the word over and over. I would put my arms around his chest and arms and press him downward and say, stay, in the early training. He finally got the idea. I had tried rewarding him with apples, but he seemed to make no connection with the apples and the performance of the deed. I always tried to use the word stay with my arm extended and fingers out with palm down. He learned that when I said go, he was to leave the area immediately. At first I had to make outlandish gestures and push him. Once I hit him with a switch, which had no effect. I decided that this was bad policy, since he was a creature of the universe, and since he was in no way dangerous to me, this was cruel. Besides, he could have easily killed me with one sweep of either hand. If I was able to capture him and turn him over to society, I assume he would be put in some sort of holding cell. He was a free-roaming creature, and incarcerating him would not be legal without just cause. After all, he committed no crime. Neither do zoo animals, but they are incarcerated just the same. The word and sound ba meant no. I tried to teach him no, but he confused it with go and would leave the area. I usually had to use ba when he would touch me too briskly or start to eat one of the small surviving spruce trees I wished to save. He would lie when I said it only when I touched him. I did not like this command, but it seemed a good one to have in our repertoire. I did not like it because it suggested commands to an animal, and my definition of animal did not fit Kong, who had all the structures of a human, including emotions, which he conveyed with his eyes and mouth. He was able to convey pleasure, anxiety, fear, serendipity, and annoyance. Once I thought he was smiling, but it was only a grimace, probably from gas, which he often expelled orally and anally with explosive force. Teaching Kong was similar to teaching the handicapped or trying to communicate with someone who spoke a different language. It was giving me my terminology, my hand signals, my emphasis on living. If we are all creatures of the universe, then there must be some language that two unlike creatures could use in communication. This was the attitude I had in trying to communicate with Kong. He understood food and eat, but did not pay attention to any commands of this nature. I would leave food on the tailgate of the station wagon and would say, Kong food on car, but there would not be an instant response to the idea of car. He would check other places where I usually left food before he got around to the car. These places included the picnic table, the cabin steps, the porch railing, and the base of a large wild cherry tree. He did not seem to grasp the meaning of yes or okay, because he had no need for asking permission. In the world of nature, the creatures take what they want or do what they wish, and are only deterred by superior force or cunning. Therefore, he did not need to ask me if it was okay to eat an apple. If he had an apple in his hand and wanted to eat it, he would do so. If I took an apple away from him and he wanted it back, I was not in any position to prevent this. I once tried training him to take food from my pockets. He was able to take a small peach from my chest pocket with ease. Wanting to really try his dexterity, I put an apple in a front pocket of my blue jeans and put his hand on it saying, Kong, food. He didn't understand this, and so I curled his fingers around the apple and he finally realized what it was. He calmly ripped my pocket down to my knee and in so doing threw me to the ground. I was happy when the apple rolled free and away from me. Kong picked it up, unconcerned, and squashed it in his mouth. When I related that Kong and I would sit and stare at each other for hours, this is not exactly the case. He would not sit, but would kneel on his knees, squat, or stand. The comfortable position for him was squat. I would try to assume his position, and the squatting position came easy to me since I was a catcher in baseball and could stay that way for hours if need be. The mountaineers of the Appalachians refer to this position as hunkering, and these people can all do it for hours while engaged in conversation and hand movements often balancing a jug and gun at the same time. I often had the feeling that Kong was studying me as much as I was studying him. I do not know his purpose, but mine of course was scientific, and it was my obligation to report his presence to the civilized world. I cannot imagine him communicating anything about me to anything or any other creature of his own likeness. Since he existed, 
I am under the impression that there are others of his kind in the universe. I suppose I should use the term Earth rather than universe, since the latter may convey the belief that he was from outer space. To me, this is absurd, given that he could not possibly operate machinery. One may argue that he was deposited here by someone who could operate a spaceship. What could possibly have gone through his mind as he squat there staring at me? I have had my boyhood dog pal stare at me and into my eyes for what seemed like hours, and in my childhood I wondered what he could have been thinking. Perhaps I am capable of the hour-long stare that pleases animals, and perhaps I hold them with an eye expression that I am not aware that I possess. In my entire association with Kong, he never once handed me anything. He never shared anything. His actions were of one of take or ignore. He would touch me, but I could never understand why. He didn't seem to be feeling my skin or analyzing me or checking me out. Just reach out and touch every once in a while. In our many hours of just squatting and looking at each other, there seemed to be no purpose on his part. He seemed to anticipate that I would devise something or do something or give him something. It does not seem strange to me that we would sit and look at each other for hours. I do that with my cat to this day. Members of certain Indian tribes of South America lie in hammocks for 16 or 18 hours a day with no communication with each other. They stare at the trees or the sky and just lay there for days. In our social structure, people who lie around for hours are frowned upon and methods of prodding and ostracism are employed against them. The longest Kong and I stared at each other in one stretch was probably two and a half hours. I do not want to give the impression that this went on in marathon fashion with a massive stare down. I would just study him for about half an hour and then do some little work around the cabin and go back to the spot and Kong would still be there ready for another half hour session. His patience was remarkable. These sessions seemed to produce a hypnotic trance on him, but when I would move it would break the spell and he would shuffle. While in the staring state, he would appear to be immobilized, but then all of a sudden he would move and break this spell. In our stare sessions, I would often reflect upon his knowledge of his environment. I wondered if he was aware that we were on a planet circling the sun and that there were other planets doing the same thing. There are, of course, a lot of people in the world unaware of this. I wondered if he had any knowledge of great metropolitan areas. Did he know that there was such a place as China or Germany or Africa? I know so many things. The amount of my knowledge staggers me when I reflect upon it. So it is with all humans. What did Kong know? What fraction of my knowledge did he possess? I suppose it really doesn't matter if a creature is aware of atoms and molecules, since it probably doesn't matter to the average human that atoms and molecules exist. They will go on with their important social relationships and their vehicle and television hang-ups, and in this area, worry when their favorite baseball team gets its next shot at a pennant. If Kong possessed knowledge of anything beyond eating, he did not relay it to me. He was a creature of the environment, and he took from the environment those things which he needed and ignored the rest. He was obviously shy of humans, and yet he had made contact with me, and seemed to enjoy it, or at least he kept coming back for more. Part 2. The Creature. Personal Experiences with Bigfoot. This video is not intended for children. As I have reflected on Kong, so do I reflect on my failure to effectively bring the existence of Kong to some scientist. It is a protective type of jealousy which inhibits the minds and hearts of scientists. We work in secret until we have proven theories or have completed our works and then we release them to the world. If the theories or works go wrong, then we don't admit it and keep our secret failures. But hope dwells eternally within us and we all wish to make some contribution to the world of knowledge. It was with this high hope that I did approach another scientist with the knowledge of Kong. These events are related later in the story. From my observations, I would have to suggest that Kong was a creature of the deep forest. He ate wild plants with gusto and could kill animals as large as a deer with ease. He broke tree limbs for their fruits. He once broke a wild pear tree limb three inches in diameter like it was a stick. I did not see him climb trees for their fruits, but I assume he could if he had to, or so wished. If the tree had visible fruit, he would shake it and gather what fell. 
Once he shook an apple tree for at least 10 minutes with no results. The tree was about 30 feet high, and it shook furiously from its trunk to its top. The lack of fruitfall did not prompt Kong to climb up after it. I do not wish to give the impression that Kong did not climb trees, for he did once, and he was very expert at it. He was heavy, but had great agility. On this particular occasion, he raced to the upper branches of an 80-foot tree without effort. His climb with feet and hands took about four seconds, about the same time it would take me to walk 20 feet on the ground. It was hand to feet and up into the branches. He seemed barely to touch the small branches as he sped upward. He rose, seemed to look around, shook the limbs he was holding with his hands, and then descended just as quickly. On his way down, however, he took time to run his hand into a bird's nest, which was within his reach. He did not remove anything from the nest. As he hit the ground, his pot gut was shaking up and down. I wondered about the bird's nest incident. Did he do that in search of a bird or eggs? I didn't try eggs on him, and I guess he would eat them if he had a chance. There was a pheasant's nest near the cabin this spring before I met Kong. It had 16 eggs in it when I discovered it, and in one day they were all gone. There was no sign of eggshells around, and it appeared to me that some raccoon or weasel or something like that carried them off. Several times before I met Kong, I would see the tops of trees shaking in the distance and assume that this was the wind patterns around the diggings. After one high wind, I had at least 30 large trees blown over. From that time, it was obvious that the wind patterns around the diggings were modified by the shape of the hills, and when an isolated tree started shaking, it did not seem strange to me. The winds and air around the diggings held many strange phenomena, and I do not associate some of the events with Kong at all. Once I had a strange experience with a small brush fire I had built near the cabin, or rather the cabin site. When I had selected the cabin site, I cleared away many of the trees, and there remained a lot of small limbs to burn since I had kept the trunks for fence posts and firewood. I had the fire going pretty good on one late afternoon when I noticed that the smoke only rose to about 20 feet and flattened out. I assumed that this was a temperature inversion and the smoke would trail out down the valley. All of a sudden, there was an explosive sound and the smoke which was overhead suddenly was forced violently to the earth. The fire went out and I gasped for a long while trying to get the smoke out of my lungs. The air became cool and the smoke dissipated except for the smoldering fire which I blew into, getting a burst of flames going. This experience was strange and even in my training in meteorology could not explain it. Another weird experience before the arrival of Kong was the incident of the fog. It appeared to come out of nowhere and stopped just below the cabin and made a cliff-like appearance along the road. I had seen fog in many shapes and forms, but never a formation like this, and a halted one at that. It stayed for a long time, and I must admit a chill came over me as I watched it dividing the landscape into two parts. I took this matter up with my neighbor, who was an old woodsman from West Virginia. He said that when he was a lad, living near the town of Parsons, one of the spook stories the elders handed him was that when someone who had died and wanted to talk to you, they would appear as a white cloud near the ground, and if you wanted to get to their message, you merely had to go and stand beneath the cloud, or if it was low enough to, stand in it, and the message would be transferred to you. Well, that's it. I do not wish to digress, but these incidents seem to be premonitions of things yet to come. Anyway, my conclusion that Kong was a creature of the deep forest was based not only on his feeding habits, but on many other criteria. He was uncomfortable in half-light, and in broad daylight he hid his eyes with his hands and squinted. From this I concluded that he was a creature of the forest where sunlight seldom penetrated. He did not approach buildings or man-made objects easily. Perhaps the others of his tribe never approached them at all. When I considered the forest, I knew that my property was connected to Chestnut Ridge by a wide band of forest. Chestnut Ridge was about 16 miles away as the crow flies, and it is entirely forested from the West Virginia border almost to the northern border of Pennsylvania. It contains Forbes State Forest and Laurel Caverns. Perhaps Kong lived in some section of the unexplored caverns. I had visited there many times, and the unexplored section extends for many miles, and some of it was under Forbes State Forest with its 200-year-old trees. 
I had wandered through this forest for years, and only once did I meet another person. It was a hunter during the doe deer season. The area is truly a wilderness. The people living on the fringes of the state forest are as wild as any forest creature. I remember parking my station wagon near a house on a gravel road and entering the forest at that location. A girl, who could be no older than eight years old, came out of the house to see what I was up to. She was smoking a cigarette, which she put in the middle of her mouth and waved at me with both hands. As stated earlier, Kong was also terrified of cultural objects made of metal, plastic, or glass. If there were others like him around, indeed, he was the pioneer of them all, since he had approached and befriended man. Perhaps they had tried it before, and one of their members was shot. The shooter may not have wanted to consult the authorities, fearing that on close examination he had killed another human, however wild-looking. Once we sat in the midst of my woods eating, I chewing wild mustard, while Kong ate handfuls of bed straw, goose grass, that I had mentioned before. For an instant, I thought I saw a dark figure through the brush about fifty feet away. I leapt up and ran toward the area to find nothing. After reflection on the event, I realized that Kong moved with blinding speed, and if there were others of his band about, they would have to want to be seen for me to see them. No human could possibly find these creatures in the wild if they did not wish to be found. Perhaps they could be tricked into exposing themselves, but this seemed remote. Perhaps a long-range telescopic camera might do the trick, but I doubt it. Close-range cameras are out of the question. Not only did Kong have good vision, but he also had sharp instincts. As stated earlier, he did not venture forth on bright sunlit days. At least he did not venture out to my knowledge. Someone someday may have a camera in his possession and come upon such a creature sleeping and take it by surprise, but even this seems unlikely since Kong's hearing was phenomenal. He would perk up and stare in a direction, and later a sound of a plane or car would come from the direction of his stare. I really don't know how he slept. I assume he did sleep, but this never occurred around me. Perhaps he slept in the daylight hours, since I never saw him except at dawn a few times and often at dusk. He was willing to stay late into the night. When I once built a fire near the picnic table, he left the area. Figuring he had departed for the night, I covered the fire only to have him appear. My conclusion was that he was afraid of fire, and this was correct. When I later tested this theory by striking a match, he shrieked and leaped away. It is probably for the best that creatures like Kong do not use fire and do not cook their food. Imagine what would happen to the large forest if there were many such creatures and they used fire in the manner of humans. I have stated that Kong would only whimper and screech, but on one occasion he made another sound which seemed to emanate from his stomach and chest. One moonlit night, after I had squared my absence from home with the powers that resided there, I sat on the porch of the cabin drinking some cheap red wine. When Kong appeared, his eyes reflected the moonlight in a manner that created a ghostly set of pits in his head. The only item in my experience to compare with this was the appearance of the eyes of the yellow pike, also known as walleye. This species is also known as pickerel. The fish have these ghostly round, moony eyes. That moonlit night, the eyes of Kong were like those of a small animal when car headlights beam upon them. I came down from the porch and squatted, and Kong immediately squatted but rose again and started to walk away. I followed him. He led me on a rather brisk walk through the high weeds and into cut over patches where berry bushes and scrubby thorny brush abounded. All the while, he made this singing noise with his chest and stomach. Finally, I had to quit the race since I was exhausted, as well as badly scratched and cut from the berry bushes. Kong continued on and didn't look back as I returned to the cabin to bathe my wounds and remove some thorns embedded around my knees. It was a cloudy day in the last week of October, and I sat at the picnic table sipping a beer. The table was one of those low types with attached seats. It was under a medium black locust-sized tree near some low brush. Beside the table, about eight feet away, was a pit and grill surrounded by log seats. Kong was to my left on the other side of the log seats, scratching in the ground, probably looking for roots or grubs. 
I contemplated what to do about divulging Kong's existence and what was to be the future of the creature and our relationship. I couldn't keep him to myself very much longer, and yet I hated to expose him to the world not of his own choosing. It was a feeling, as I recall, like I was about to double-cross an old and trusted friend, although I had only been acquainted with him about six weeks up to that time. As I remember the situation, the air was warm even though the clouds cast an aura of grey over everything. A slight wind was blowing from Kong to me, and I could detect his odour in the air. It was a mild form of wet dog, and if I smelled it to this day, I would be sure to recognise it again. There must be something primeval in the sense of smell, since an odour once recognised is never forgotten. I guess that's what the perfume industry is based on. Well, anyway, the perfume industry wouldn't be interested in duplicating Kong's odour, for it was a disgusting thing, and I remember the fact that I was downwind from him on that particular day. I heard a slight noise to my right and looked up to see an old gentleman approaching about ten feet away. He was dressed in a faded red shirt and what apparently once were dress trousers. He wore glasses, the rims of which seemed to hold up a straw hat. I shouted to Kong, Stay! Terror filled the eyes of the creature, and he froze in his digging position. Kong was pretty good at freezing in place, and he could hold a position for a long time, almost without breathing. The old man approached and put one foot on the table seat on the opposite side of the table. He made some familiar, how are you's, and the usual first friendly remarks. He stated that he was gathering mushrooms, and that he didn't know that there was a cabin here. He displayed about a half a chip basket of mushrooms, some of the edibility of which I doubted. He smoothed them over in front of me, and picked up a few of the large ones, and held them between us, and made remarks about the ages of mushrooms and how he cooked them, and so forth, along those lines. He stated that he and his dad had gathered berries and mushrooms on this property for years. The old man went on to say that he had just suffered a long illness, and was now allowed to go out alone and walk in the woods and gather berries and things. He had missed the berry season, and almost the only thing growing now was mushrooms. There were nuts, but the butternut trees were all gone from this area, and the hickory nut trees were all bitter nut hickory, and the walnuts were plentiful, but they were more trouble than they were worth. Did I mind if he worked over my property, and I assured him that it was all right. I worried that he might notice Kong, and made plans for shifting my body around, and would lead the old man down the road. He was so engrossed in looking into my face that I was certain that he wouldn't notice Kong. The conversation went this way for almost five minutes, and then the old man spotted Kong, crouching and staring at him from his freeze position. The old man looked at Kong, and then at me, and laughed weakly. <laughs> Then he shot his eyes from Kong to me, and back again to Kong, and then to me, and gave a series of he 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 which resembled a toned-down Woody Woodpecker. I made no comment, but looked at him while he continued his eye shifting from Kong to me, and the nervous laughing. I really didn't know what to do. I didn't want to introduce Kong, or tell the man anything at all, and so I just pretended Kong wasn't there. Finally, the old man removed his foot from the bench, picked up the mushroom basket which he had set on the table, and started over to the road. His gait was halting, and I expected him to fall down or something, but he reached the road and moved down it swiftly, without looking back. I thought that this was the end of my secret, for the old man was sure to tell someone, and they would come out to see the creature. Perhaps no one believes an old man's statements, for no one ever came around to investigate. Then perhaps the old man never told anyone. He might have even had a heart attack before he had a chance to repeat his story. Maybe the mushrooms got him. I had walked down to the property line to see if he had made it out all right, and he wasn't anywhere around, so I guess he got off okay. Then again, maybe the old man's illness was mental, and he did not wish to return to confinement. Anyway, there was no evidence that the man had ever informed anyone about the encounter. After I returned from the property line, Kong was nowhere in sight. I assumed that he had moved away, but after about ten minutes of my return to the table, and well started on my second beer, Kong came out through a tall stand of brush. He apparently was checking on the old man himself. I then went to the cabin and returned with two apples and handed them to Kong. He pushed them both into his mouth at once, and chomped them around with the juices squirting out in all directions. Had I not been there and told Kong to stay, I wonder if he would have been seen at all. 
The old man came from the same direction toward Kong as I was sitting, and it was likely that Kong thought his footsteps were made by me. Kong was also upwind from us, and he was keen at detecting odors. He would not have had difficulty from his position. I had no knowledge of Kong's ability to detect odors, except that he first came around when I was sweaty and not bathed. Also, he may have been taken by surprise, for Kong's vigilance may have been relaxed with me around. Biology and anthropology were not my fields, and I felt at a loss for the proper way to study the creature. I was willing to give complete credit to anyone I could trust and turn the creature over to him. It was not my acceptance alone, which was necessary, but Kong would have some say in the proceedings that were about to be undertaken. I ran several scientists in my area through my mind and reviewed my association with them. Most were good fellows, who liked a joke and a light conversation, along with their serious pursuit of science. I finally settled on two possibilities, a wildlife expert from the local college and a zoology instructor from a neighboring institution. I finally decided on Barney Prescott, the zoology instructor. It was a Wednesday morning when I drove the 30-odd miles to the college. Parking was at a premium there, since this was a commuter institution. I ended up parking on a street several blocks from the campus. Students with jock jackets were all over the place, leaning on parking meters and sitting on curbs, even though the weather was quite chilly. I asked directions to the biology department, since I had never been there, even though I knew Barney well from having served on several state committees with him. After several false starts, I found the place and read the roster outside the main biology office. Dr. B. Prescott was in office 214C, and his office hours started in about half an hour. I didn't want to have to track him down, so I went over to the student snack bar and had a cup of coffee while I waited for the time to elapse. There I studied the boisterous behavior and language of the students, and compared them and their lifestyles to those of Kong. The creature Kong won by comparison. I finally found Barney in his office and was greeted warmly. We talked for an hour or so and I told him that I had a lead on a Bigfoot-like creature and perhaps he might wish to check it out with me. Even though he and I had many a joke and beer together at conventions, he knew that I was serious and so he responded seriously. Barney stated that this was a topic of interest to him and that he had made several casts of possible footprints of such a creature when he was a student in Idaho. He had also traveled to western Oregon where he had interviewed many people about the Sasquatch and he was certain that such creatures existed. Sasquatch was the Indian name for such creatures. He showed me a footprint cast he had made. I put my foot beside it and felt that it could not possibly be related to Kong since his feet were not that large. Anyway, it appeared that I had come to the right man. Barney related stories of hunters, fishermen, and lumbermen of the Cascade Mountains who saw the creatures. He told me about the 10-second film made by a man on horseback. Barney had a theory about the native Indians knowing and communicating with the Sasquatch, but keeping these close associations secret since the white and black men are both deceitful and cannot be trusted. He also stated that such a creature existed in Russia, and the Russians referred to the ape-man as Almas. We decided to meet on Thursday at 3, and I would lead him to the area of my suspicions. Barney had a jeep, and we would go in that vehicle. We wanted to meet earlier, but my duties were over at 2, and I couldn't possibly get away before 3. I mentioned that I thought the creature would be more available at dusk, but he said the deep woods were always in dusk, even in daylight. I walked back to my car thinking that I had made a good choice and how great it would be to work with a pleasant fellow like Barney. When I got to my car, I found it vandalized. My radio antenna was broken, the hubcaps were gone, and the window was jimmied on the passenger side and my briefcase was missing. I made my way to the local police station and dutifully reported the incident to a board desk clerk who sent me away with the comforting thought that my insurance would cover it. At three the next day, Barney pulled up in his jeep with a grin of high expectation on his face. He was dressed in a camouflage outfit, including a duck hunter's cap. This seemed funny, and he asked if I was bringing anything, especially some scotch whiskey, since he knew my addiction to the stuff. I said no, and piled in and told him to head for the main highway. As we drove along, I looked in the back and saw walkie-talkies, binoculars, cameras, 
and to my horror, a high-powered rifle. I leaned over the seat further and spotted a box of rifle shells. After questioning him about the rifle, he stated that his investigations indicated that the Sasquatch were huge people, and even though no one had been harmed by them, we shouldn't let our guard down for a minute. We had to be prepared to protect ourselves, and we wouldn't use the gun unless it was absolutely necessary. However, we would take it into the brush with us. I didn't know whether to tell him about Kong's aversion to mechanical instruments or not. I let him drive beyond the Diggins Road and led him to the state game lands just north of Dunbar, where I had spent many days hiking in the past. The enthusiasm had gone out of my personality and out of my relationship with Barney. We unloaded from the Jeep, and I laced my hiking boots and adjusted my jacket. We had about two hours of daylight left, and I planned to hike him over the rough and ragged rocks, up and down every mountain possible. Who knows, we might still have seen Bigfoot in this wilderness area, since it was game lands with food for wild animals. We walked fast and furious. Barney kept protesting that it would be best to get to a cave area and explore it, so I took him to a small cave area I knew, and he poked around it with his rifle ready, while I pretended to sit upon the upper rocks and act as a spotter. There were many assorted tracks around the cave, and a grouse startled Barney, sending him reeling backward. Actually, it would have been a lot of fun if I didn't have a more serious line of thought. Darkness was falling fast as we got to a tributary stream of Dunbar Creek and followed it to the main creek area. In the near darkness, a raccoon could be seen at the water's edge where the tributary met the main stream. Barney pulled up his rifle and took aim and blasted the raccoon into oblivion. I asked him why he shot the coon, and he answered that he hated to bring out his rifle without using it, and he was very anxious to try his new scope. He didn't take to the idea of shooting a tree or the already bullet-ridden signs along the creek area. We walked over to the animal, which lay there with its head half shot away. Along its side was a fish of some sort, about eight inches long. The coon was apparently eating or getting ready to eat the fish. Barney nudged the lifeless carcass with his foot, and with a quick jerk, he drop-kicked the coon into the water. With disgust and a sick feeling in my stomach, I kicked the fish in, and we made our way back to the car by moonlight. When we got into the car, Barney stated that even though we didn't see Bigfoot, it was a lot of fun, and we should do it again soon. I promised to call him, but have not contacted him to this day. With this event, I scratched all people from my confidence list. It was the middle of the first week of November, and Kong had not appeared for a few days. The diggings seemed lifeless without him as I walked the new blazed road around the property. It was early afternoon, and I carried my machete with which I cut brambles or limbs that protruded onto the road. As I cut away a few brambles, I looked down and saw two spent shotgun shells. Suddenly it dawned on me. Hunting season had begun in Pennsylvania. My thoughts were of Kong. I had to get him out of this populated area, even though no one bothered me in the middle of my woods. At least they didn't bother me while I was there. The border of the property was posted with signs of no trespassing and no hunting. My cabin was burglarized, but these elusive beings did not frequent the area when I was about. The side of the cabin was peppered with buckshot the first year it was built, and since that time there were hunters, but never while I was there. The cabin was in the midst of a large hunting population, and in November the roads and hillsides of this area were dotted with red, brown, and orange-clad men, followed by yelping dogs. Pennsylvania sold more hunting licenses than any other state last year, and it is truly a hunter's paradise, teeming with all sorts of game. What could I do to protect Kong? I mulled over the situation and wondered if the hunters would obey my no-hunting signs but already there were spent cartridges lying about. The urge to kill something must be innate in humans. I remember my encounter with the 13-year-old boy who stopped by my pond one day. After our initial approaches and getting acquainted palaver, he indulged me with stories of his killing prowess. Even though it is illegal for a boy his age to possess a firearm in our state without being accompanied by an adult, he claimed his mother had just bought him a $75 shotgun for his 13th birthday. With this weapon, he succeeded in knocking off hundreds of crows, some groundhogs, raccoons, squirrels, rabbits, and possums. With each species blasted, 
he was able to relate somewhat interesting stories of their demise. I asked the kid why he did it, and all he could say was that it was fun. At the time, I hoped that this was just juvenile bragging, but the kid had a real knowledge of the hunting experience, and I credited him with at least half of his kills. He would probably grow up to be a professor of zoology, like Barney. My brother-in-law hunts groundhogs each summer and leaves them lie where he shoots them. It's hard on the groundhog, but the carcasses do return to nature, that which it took from nature, just as yours and mine will. As the boy and I continued talking, a hawk flew over, and the boy made a motion as if he was raising an imaginary rifle to blast it. Bang, he shouted. I tried to get him by saying that if he killed the hawk, it would be a split second of satisfaction to him, and the hawk would be gone forever from the earth. It would be a living thing destroyed, never to return. He countered by saying that he knew a place in eastern Pennsylvania where millions of hawks pass through each year, and some day he was going to go there with his dad. The boy came around about a week or two after our first encounter and asked if he could spear some frogs, and when I refused, he went away. I did find some frog remains around the pond a few weeks after that, which I attributed to him, but I had no proof of his involvement. He must be a pretty big kid by now, and I hope his itchy trigger finger has been satisfied and he has taken up other pursuits. My plan was to lure Kong into my car and transport him to a less populated area, if that was at all possible. I had two remote areas in mind. There was the various wilderness areas of West Virginia and the northern forest area of central Pennsylvania. Either one of these would serve to hide him from the hunting population. The fact that he has survived all these years did not enter my mind. Northern Pennsylvania contains the only national forest east of the Mississippi River. It is a large area covering most of four counties. It prides itself in its virgin timber and the fact that it is the only national forest to show a continuous profit from its management skills. First I had to see Kong again. A thought flashed through my mind that he may even be shot now, but it would have made the papers if this were so. He was still around, and it would now take patience to see him with so many people out in the wilds this time of year. I returned home and told Sally that I was lecturing to a conversation group that evening, and I would not be home for supper, and would probably return home around midnight. She reminded me that she still did not trust me, and asked for more information. I made it up as I went along. I told her that there would be a dinner for the group at the Holiday Inn in the county seat of Washington, Pennsylvania, and I was the main speaker. I did identify the group and didn't go into the lecture topic too clearly since it was a complicated title, but would tell her all about it when I returned home. She appeared to accept this. As late afternoon approached, I waited for Kong with much nervousness. I was extremely relieved when he did appear. The sun was sinking rapidly, emitting a red glow which framed the approaching Kong on the horizon, visible through the naked tree trunks. I greeted Kong by touching him and handing him an apple which he quickly devoured. To complete my lure, I put apples up front in the wagon and told Kong to get them. He had never been in the car before and leaned over to get the apples from the rear without actually getting in. I picked up his feet, he was heavy, and pushed him into the rear. He resisted a little and helped by stooping down further and following my pushing lead moved his body to the front where the apples were. Once I had him inside, I closed the tailgate and went around to the driver's seat. Kong panicked when I slammed the door and started the electric rear window winding upward. He began screaming and clawing wildly at the upholstery, tearing huge chunks of it away. I put my hand back to stop him, but he caught my hand with his wrist and he swung wildly. The pain shot all the way to my shoulder, but my hand and arm was not broken, just bruised. I yelled at Kong to stay but he continued whacking away at the rear of the wagon. I was hoping that he didn't get his body set where he could get leverage. Finally, when I turned the car to back around, he was flown flat to the front. I said, lie, as loudly as I could. The word exploded from my lips. Kong, momentarily stunned, rolled over on his back with his head towards the front seat. I put my hand on the top of his head and started the car. He whimpered, but I kept my right hand on him and clumsily drove the car with my left hand, the wrist of which was aching. I believe it was the initial trust that I built up with Kong which made him quiet and accept the ride. 
After about a half hour, the stars came out and Kong settled. I could take my hand from him, but I kept a quiet low patter of conversation. Kong watched the stars fly by as I headed the car north toward the New York border. There was wild country up there, and that I had known many years ago. There were several nice places to choose from. There was Cook State Forest, which had large virgin hemlocks and oaks. There was the Allegheny National Forest that had smaller trees, but very few tourists and settlements. This is the place upon which I had decided to release Kong. Here lived deer and black bear and a host of lesser animals. The only known lobo timber wolves were in cages near a town called Kane. This was the icebox of Pennsylvania. Deep, remote woodlands. Surely Kong would be safe there. The trip was uneventful except for my apprehension. Kong traveled well, and I was able to keep my hand from him in the dark areas, but when I had to drive through a small town, he would whimper, and I would put my hand on him as we went under streetlights and along lighted yards. I finally arrived at my destination, a secondary road halfway between the towns of Pigeon and Lynch in the heart of the Allegheny National Forest. The area was slightly southwest of Bradford, which was one of the larger oil towns of this remote Northland. I stopped the car, rolled down the rear window while Kong whimpered. Opening the tailgate, I called to Kong to go. He stepped out of the wagon and approached me as I backed off. I made the gestures and shouted go, but he just stood there. As one would abandon a dog, I jumped into the car, tailgate still down, started the motor, peeled out spinning tires and drove away. I got a glimpse of Kong through the rearview mirror and was glad that it was too dark to see his expression. When I returned home about an hour after midnight, Sally was waiting for me. You're still running around with that girl, aren't you? Well, I called her parents and told them all about you two. It appeared that somewhere, some poor girl was now catching hell from her parents. This was the gist of the conversations for the next 10 or 15 minutes. I denied my guilt and told her she could check my story. She was way ahead of me, for she had driven to Washington and to the Holiday Inn where the owner had never heard of such a banquet. I tried to put her on the defensive by saying how could I be square with her when she had absolutely no trust in me, and perhaps I was testing her. She wasn't buying any of that, and what's more she was now considering divorce. I wondered if Kong was worth the price I had to pay for my association with him. Classes resumed, and the next day I routinely met my groups, but my lack of enthusiasm was obvious. In the early morning, I called the local newspaper and gave them a news story about my alleged lecture with appropriate quotes from the speech. The man who took the story seemed glad to get it and agreed to have it printed in the afternoon edition. I felt at the time that I was saved. At supper, the paper arrived and I let Sally read it first. Anticipation rose within me as I watched her read every page out of the corner of my eye. She seemed to take exceptionally long, and I wondered if the article I had called in had made the addition. Sally made no comment about my article, and when she put the paper down, I grabbed it eagerly. The article was there all right, but everything was mixed up. My name was so misspelled that it was not even remotely familiar, and the facts of the speech was so fouled that it was impossible to figure out the nature of the article, let alone the gist of the speech. Some of the facts were near enough, and I pointed this out to Sally. She fumbled around with the paper for a while, and then deftly creased it and tore out the article and took it upstairs, I assumed to her files. There was nothing to do but go to the cabin. The atmosphere at home was intense, and few words were spoken. I began to understand such phrases as, the silence hung heavy, and, oh, what a tangled web we weave when we first practice to deceive. I drove mechanically to the diggings. The lack of sleep was catching up on me. When I arrived at the diggings, who should be waiting beside the porch but Kong? How did he get back so quickly? He had covered over 200 miles in less than a day. His body reeked of foul sweat, but he appeared happy as I gave him several apples. He flashed much teeth. I don't think he was smiling, but there he was flashing teeth, which I hoped was a sign of good cheer and that he was not planning to bite me. I must admit that I was very happy to see him, and the disturbances at home made me look upon Kong as an old friend. I told him about my situation, and I'm certain he didn't understand any of it. I didn't understand any of it either. Let me review what had transpired. 
Kong had traveled about 200 miles, that's as the crow flies, in less than 24 hours for a minimum speed of about 10 miles per hour. He had found his way back from a remote area of Pennsylvania. Perhaps this was his interest in the stars, and perhaps he traveled by them. Or was he familiar with the area and had traveled around there many times? After reflection upon the situation, I decided that Kong could be elusive if he wished, and that my fears of his being shot were unfounded. For the rest of November, I heard shotguns and rifles firing within my woods and on neighboring property. When the hunting season ended and December appeared, Kong was still alive and still coming to the diggings for his ration of apples. Apples were now getting rarer in the markets, and I went to an apple cider mill and made a deal for several bushels, which were being saved for future pressing. I was also given four bushels of pressed apples. When asked why I wanted the pressed apples, I said it was for my compost pile. I tried to get Kong into various activities in order to test his agility, strength, and speed. These did not meet with much success. I would run, but he would not follow. I would break sticks, but he would not. I would throw stones, but he would not. I tried blocking him like a football tackle, but he just stood there without changing his position. I brought him a volleyball, but he ignored it. When I crowded him and he objected, he would merely shove me away and I would go sprawling. Once I produced a sheet of paper and with a pencil, I grew a quick sketch of Kong with eyes and all, and he watched me. I was rather pleased that he stood for this, and when I handed him the paper to view it closer, he took it, sniffed it, and then ate it. I'm not an artist, but I did make several sketches. None of them met with my satisfaction, but I kept some of them anyway. Kong was just a big hunk of a creature. He did not get angry. He did not get frustrated. If he had desires, he did not communicate them to me. I wondered if he contemplated his creator and his place in the cosmos. Ideas do not seem to be of any value unless they can be communicated to another being. I wish that I could discuss the nature of the universe with Kong, but he was not up to it, and the many questions and ideas that I had in mind were of no significance. I reflected on hermits who lived with their dogs and goats, and wondered how they satisfied this need to communicate with beings that would understand and feel the frustration of an idea which would never bear fruit. I did have one partial success with discovering how to communicate with Kong. It was a success that could have been devastating had it not come to a conclusion. I had wondered if I could train Kong into doing some useful chores for me. My property was overrun with scrub trees and berry bushes in a section which was once a plowed field and now allowed to grow over. I thought that if I could get Kong to uproot some of the smaller trees, I could clear the section and have a small tract of pasture land available. This would attract a series of open field animals and birds and add to the variety of life forms on the property. I walked to the section with Kong one evening just before sunset. It was not his habit to follow me when I walked away from the cabin area, but if I withheld the apples, I could lure him along for a short distance. I often wondered why he didn't simply take the apples from me. Perhaps he had some sense of ownership. It was getting colder as winter was coming, and the chill in the air was biting. The leaves were gone, and the bleakness of the winter sky was in harmony with the bleakness of the vegetation. The wind whipped up the dry leaves underfoot as I and the creature walked along. This was to be an experiment in communication, and if I could get my message across, I would save myself many hours of work and would have made a giant stride in my relationship with Kong. When we got to the brush area, I pulled up some small bush. It did not come out easily, and there was much puffing and straining. I decided to get out a smaller bush and told Kong to watch. He didn't know what I meant, and his head rolled from side to side studying the brush. What I was doing was of no concern to him. I went over to him, took his hand, and led him to a small plant, a crabapple tree about two feet high. I bent the plant over with my feet and pulled Kong's hand down until it reached the base of the tree and tried to put his fingers around it. He gave me a shove with his other hand, and once again he sent me sprawling. I let fly a series of curses and went back to him and tried to explain that I wanted the bush torn up and took his hand again and placed it on the bush. He yawned and was unconcerned. I pulled up several more seedlings. Kong started to watch what I was doing. 
I pulled up a few small cherry, hawthorn, crab apple, and black locust trees. After each pulling, I would smooth the disturbed dirt with my feet and put the small bush on the brush pile which was growing fast. After about the fifteenth bush, Kong came over to where I had smoothed back the dirt and ran his hand through it, turning up a few milk-white grubs. To my surprise, he picked these up and ate them. He went to the other spots which were torn up and did the same thing. These were not as rewarding as the last spot. Perhaps the grubs had a chance to burrow deeper. Kong pulled up a few plants and searched the roots for grubs. He beat the plants against the ground and went through the materials which had fallen off. It was getting pretty dark by then, and the things he ate from the refuse, I assume, were grubs. I told Kong that I would see him tomorrow. I don't think he understood tomorrow, but I said a lot of things to him that I didn't think he understood. My path back to the cabin was difficult. Kong did not follow me, but stayed behind tearing up small bushes. He seemed to have great night vision and was perfectly comfortable in the failing light. As I arrived back at the cabin the next day, I was pleased with myself for having made a breakthrough with Kong. It was now a matter of time before I could find the method or secret of communication and put him to use. This was to be the highest level of exploitation. I would get hard work. In return, he would get almost nothing except apples. When I reached the cabin area, I was shocked to see all the low planting and much of the side brush torn up and scattered about. I had created a monster, much in the pattern of Dr. Frankenstein. How could I now control him? I didn't want the entire county torn to shreds. As I viewed the uprooted trees while sitting on the railing of the porch, the sound of a distant motor grew louder. It was a bright orange pickup truck coming up the driveway, and as it cleared the trees I could see that it was a West Penn Power Company truck. The truck pulled to a stop, and a middle-aged man wearing a yellow hard hat and carrying a clipboard jumped out. He walked briskly by me without speaking, went to the side of the cabin, and jotted down the reading of the electric meter. As he came back, he was startled and remarked that he didn't even see me and wasn't looking for anyone since he didn't see my car. We exchanged pleasantries, and he finally asked, What the hell happened here? I told him I wasn't sure, and he countered by theorizing that it was Halloween pranksters. Them goddamn kids should all be in jail. And... You should see what they do to my truck when I just leave it out overnight. With a few more remarks along these lines, he entered the truck hitting his hard hat along the rim of the door frame, slammed the door, started the vehicle, and whipped it around and gassed it out of sight. Much to my satisfaction, the uprooting of small plants had ceased almost as fast as it had started. Kong had had a one-night binge and then forgot what he had done, or preferred not to do it again. I breathed easier the next two days when I found no new areas of uprooting. I had learned a few things from the experience. I would not try to get him to do anything which might lead to damage again. One of the trees he tore up was a black locust twelve feet high and four inches in diameter, measured two feet above the roots. Its top was shunted, and it probably should have been taller. It was here I learned that Kong did eat grubs, and when I mentioned him digging for grubs earlier in this story... I was not aware that that was what he was actually doing at the time. I mentioned digging for grubs more as a depiction of the scene rather than reality. I wondered if he would eat mature insects, and I was about to set up a test for him. A few days after the tree uprooting, I captured moths in my woodpile and tried to get Kong to eat them, but he refused. He also refused various kinds of larvae, which were under the bark of logs in the woodpile. He did eat a few small black beetles, wings and all, but this did not seem to be of any significance. Humans can, of course, eat almost any insect or larva without having any ill effects. In fact, beetles, ants, bees, and cicada are nutritious, and if we could get over our prejudices against them, we would find them welcome additions to our diets. I do not want to give the impression that I do not practice what I preach. I have eaten beetles, ants, bees, and cicadas, and this is why I mention them. These are best roasted on an open pan in an oven, and then they take on the consistency of popped corn or cornflakes. I have not been able to bring myself to eat grubs or any other kind of larva. Grasshoppers are plentiful, and I understand that certain peoples of Africa and the Middle East eat them. The American Indian was supposed to have eaten grasshoppers, but I cannot avoid my prejudices and have not been able to try and eat them. As a boy, my friends and I slaughtered the grasshopper locusts in large numbers 
and the memory of their juices flying will never leave my mind. In communication with Kong, I believed that I was the teacher, and other than curiosity, he had nothing to offer from which I could learn. As I look back at two events, I cannot help but chuckle. The two separate events were indeed lessons in embarrassment and morality. The first episode involved what can loosely be described as bathroom behavior. It was on a warm day, and evening was almost upon us. Kong squatted near the corner of the cabin, and I stood leaning on the side of the building facing him. We stared at each other in our usual manner when he suddenly broke from the stair, rose and stepped off to the side into high uncut weeds. He reached down and scooped up a hole in the earth about ten feet from me and squatted higher than usual. From his ass, he extruded a large solid turd. As this was extruding, he looked at me without expression. After he had finished, he covered the turd with dirt using his hand. Then he came back to squat and stare at me. I remember that feeling was one of embarrassment watching him. I believe I even looked away. When he returned to the place in front of me, I felt among other emotions besides embarrassment, apologetic. I couldn't explain this emotion. I had been around animals enough all my life and certainly did not have feelings of this nature around them. As young boys growing up in the woods, it was common practice to crap when the urge was upon us. However, after Kong left, I reflected upon my feelings and cursed myself. Why should anyone be embarrassed by defecation? That's a fancy word for shitting. Somewhere in my upbringing, I was led to believe that shitting was unnatural, and perhaps there were mortals who did not engage in the practice. Every living creature shits. You, me, the president, the king, the queen, the pope, and all things of the animal world. To conjugate, I shit, you shit, he and she shits, we shit, they shit, we have shit. They had shit. Need I go on? It's a natural function, and I curse myself for having been affronted by it. My scientific curiosity, however, did convince me to dig up the turd the next day and measure it. It consisted mostly of choke cherry seeds. These were bound together by brownish green matter, which was unidentifiable to me. The turd was partly coiled, so I had laid a string upon it, then stretched out the string and measured a length of 14 and 1 quarter inches. It was an even two inches in diameter at the center position, which tapered toward one end. I don't know what this has to do with anything, but that's what happened, and those were the measurements. The other event is rather humorous, now that I reflect upon it, but at the time, some Puritan influence overcame me. Kong had arrived at the cabin with this massive erection. Usually his penis hung limp, and after a time it ceased to exist. He never urinated around me, so there was no need to dwell upon it. I wondered if he held the penis when he urinated, or was it just a release as horses do? When the penis was limp, it seemed to be about an inch in diameter and about six inches long. It looked very human, with a red head that occasionally poked out from the foreskin. His testicles were not overly large, but they hung to about the same length as the penis. I had the same attitude toward Kong that I had toward other players on the football team as we dressed and undressed for our various practices and games. The big ones and the little ones got some attention for a time, then everyone got around to ignoring penis and balls and went about their duties for the team. So this was my attitude toward Kong. Well, here was Kong with a glowing heart on, standing in front of me. I gave him two apples, which he promptly ate. As he stood around, I felt uneasy and once again embarrassed. Occasionally, he would touch the end of his penis and seem to be brushing away flies, but none were in evidence. He was not masturbating. Finally, I told him to get the hell out of here, and if he had a female, to go and find her. Of course, he didn't understand what I was saying. Whenever I wanted Kong to go away, I would go in the cabin and pull the curtains closed. He would circle the cabin and look into the windows, but when the curtains were closed, he would usually go away after about a half hour when I didn't try to communicate with him. Often I have reflected on the burglars who had stole the first set of curtains and shades from the windows. What would they have thought when they were taking out the furniture if Kong had come upon them? I mused at the thought of training Kong to be a watchman, trained to maim burglars. In my imagination, I pictured him throwing them in every conceivable fashion. Burglars were anonymous creatures, and the thoughts of them gave me the creeps, but for these imaginary trips, I gave them faces and body builds, and Kong pushed these into various stages of distortion. However, I digress and should get back to the story. 
Kong finally did go away, and I was relieved. I took up my water jug and walked over the hill toward the stream in the spring from which I obtained water. My cabin did not have running water, and does not to this day have running water. As I approached the bottom of the hill, I could see the cows in the pasture on the other hillside. There was a noisy commotion among the cows, and when I put the water jug down and walked over, I could see Kong. He was mounted on a large Holstein cow and was shoving away. The cow would start to walk away, and Kong would lift his legs and hang on with his hands cupped under the side of the cow until it would stop, and then he would begin working his buttocks rapidly again. And once again, I was stupidly embarrassed. Kong continued his activity for what seemed to me an interminable length of time, but it was probably about five or six minutes. I walked back to the water jug, picked it up, went to the spring, loaded up, and returned to the cabin. I was sitting on the porch when Kong returned to the cabin. He was visible in the light rays beaming from the cabin, and I could see his penis dripping, and for the first time I could detect his breathing. I started hollering at him, and he looked bewildered. He held out his hand for apples. I went into the cabin, got three, and gave them to him, and he promptly pushed these into his mouth. I gave him some more hell and finally asked myself what it was I was doing. I even threatened that the farmer would shoot him. I began to get some glimpses of the idea of morality. Certainly this act was neither moral nor immoral. It had no bearing on me, him, or eternity. It was just an event that had no significance. Perhaps he felt relieved and this was a positive good. If there is such a thing as good or evil, I don't know. All I can conclude is that the event was of no moral significance. Good and evil are concepts that exist only in the mind of the beholder. It did prove that Kong knew of other animals and some use that could be made of them other than food. I told Kong there were no more apples and that he should leave. I headed for the car and Kong started slowly up the road toward the top of the hill. I hollered after him, You picked the ugliest one. Part 3. The Creature. Personal Experiences with Bigfoot. This video is not intended for children. One strange action or reaction by Kong that will probably never be understood by me occurred in a late afternoon thunderstorm. The weather had been particularly hot that day, and all day long I noticed the building up of huge banks of clouds. The clouds would start off as white, large, fluffy clouds to the southwest, and as they approached directly south, they would have high vertical development. They would be in groups of four or five, and they would move on, and after an hour or so, a new group would move in and pass along the horizon. As the daylight hours dwindled, the clouds moved closer to my area of the world, and I sat on the porch and watched them approaching. Just as the light began to fail, flashes of lightning appeared way off in the distance, and a light rain splattered on the roof of the cabin and tinkled down the aluminum gutters and into my rain barrel. It was with the onset of the rain that Kong arrived at the cabin and picked a spot near the rain barrel and crouched there. He stared straight ahead and my talking did not evoke any response from him. He refused the apples I held out to him. I put the palm of my hand against his forehead to see if he was warm, but he was not. The pressure of my hand did not budge him from his crouching and staring. Not only was his reaction strange, but it was strange since Kong did not appear at the cabin in wet weather. A great gust of wind flapped the tar paper of the cabin roof and bent the large nearby trees. Lightning split the air and a round of thunder pealed across the landscape. Kong leapt to his feet and jumped up and down like an Indian dancing in a second-rate movie. The rain started in earnest, beating colored leaves to the ground while lightning flashed again, lighting the darkness and exposing Kong's dance. A spectacular electric display occurred down near the main road. Lightning struck near a large wild black cherry tree. I could see the flash. It didn't disappear, but changed into two round balls, which appeared to be the size of basketballs. The balls of light danced around the tree trunk for what seemed a couple of minutes, then disappeared. As I reflect on it, the time was probably only a couple of seconds. Kong rushed toward the underbrush, and with a snap of his wrist, broke off a five-foot cherry tree at its base. He started whipping the ground and the larger trees, I moved up on the porch, for the force of his blows were echoing through the darkness, and I didn't want to be hit with such force. Kong continued the whipping with one hand, and then two hands until the storm subsided, and the local lightning and thunder had moved on. 
When he whipped with one hand, he would hit his chest or pound his thigh with the other, or put the unoccupied hand in motion as if to keep his balance. This display lasted about 25 minutes in all. When he finally threw what was left of his switch down, he went over to the rain barrel and put his head up to the overflowing water and slurped huge slurps. I turned the cabin porch light on and went around to the front of the cabin to see him. I could only see him by indirect light because a direct light would cause him to seek the shadows unless it hit him by accident. Kong put his head and body into a crouching position as I approached. Water was dripping from his hair, sending out glints of reflected light. I approached cautiously, since his head-bent crouch was a new position for me. As I got closer, Kong's posture changed to one of challenge. Eyes front, arms out from his sides, fingers extended and knees bent. He looked like a gunfighter without sidearms. When I finally confronted him, I could see fear in his eyes. While this was going on, the clouds had cleared and a three-quarter moon hit the yard. Away in the distance, heat lightning flashed. Kong presented a rather fearful image. He flashed his teeth, which seemed extra enormous under the circumstances. He stood there crouched, eyes wide and staring, and teeth flashing. A hissing sound came forth with each flash of teeth. I stood and watched this for a few minutes, and then I backed off. Walking backwards without breaking the stair down between us, I made my way to the porch steps and clambered up. Kong relaxed from his hunching position, took another large slurp of rainwater, and made for the underbrush. His exit was swift, and as the large frame entered the brush area, it made no sound. I waited a few minutes, then walked over to the same underbrush and walked in. The noise of twigs and snapping brush that I made must have disturbed everything around. There was a disturbing news article in the Uniontown newspaper of the previous day. It was a report of a dead man found along the main road on Chestnut Ridge. The investigating officer said the man was bruised and apparently fell from a great height and his neck was broken. There would be no question that it would be considered an accidental death if there were high buildings or elevated places in evidence. It was considered a homicide. I thought perhaps the man had run into and challenged Kong, and Kong slammed him to the ground. It was a vivid sight in my mind that I soon dismissed, since I knew that Kong would evade people rather than challenge them, but the previous night, he seemed to be challenging me. It was the last day of the year when I went out to the cabin about noon. I had planned to check on things and affix signs to the cabin saying that the place had been set with booby traps. This was to scare away burglars, since another raid had been made on my place, and the rain barrel mentioned previously had been taken. It was a large wooden barrel with steel bands, the kind used to make wine. I now had to be content with a steel drum. To my surprise, I found Kong huddled near the porch. As I approached, he slowly extended an arm with the hand clenched in a fist. I touched his extended hand and held it a while with my left hand. He drew it closer to his body worked his fist loose and tucked both arms up together under his chest. He closed his eyes. He was obviously ill. I felt his forehead and it was hotter than hell. I didn't know what to do. I entered the cabin and withdrew a blanket and brought it to him and covered him. This was the first time I had attempted to put a man-made object upon him. He did not resist. He just crouched further, almost under the cabin, which was about 30 inches off the ground at that spot. I really was at a loss as to what to do. Sally was expecting me home. Since our bitter argument a few months ago, I felt that I should toe the line and it was best that I return home and take her to dinner somewhere. I returned to the cabin and took three aspirin out of the bottle and filled a glass with water from my jug and went to Kong. I held the tablets and said, Kong, food, but he didn't move. I then took his head, turned it toward me and said, open, which was the cue for him to open his mouth when we played at this. To my surprise, he feebly opened his mouth, and I threw in the three aspirins. He closed his mouth and refused the water. It started to rain, and we were half under the roof eave and half out with both of us getting wet. I bent over him and forced him under the cabin. He fell forward, stretching out his full length, and with reflex action, slowly curled into the fetal position. I crawled in beside him and covered him with the blanket. I must have stayed another half hour before I decided to go on home. When I arrived, Sally began quizzing me about the obvious worried look on my face and what was I thinking about anyway. 
Finally, 8 o'clock rolled around and I announced to Sally that I was going out to the cabin to spend New Year's Eve and that I was troubled and she should not take it personally. She accused me of going to meet some whore and she worried that I would have the only vehicle available since her car was being repaired. I agreed to leave the car with her and I would walk to the cabin, a distance of 8 miles. So I bid her farewell, dressed in rain gear, took the flashlight and with an umbrella took off for the cabin. I arrived there sometime around 10 o'clock and sought out Kong. He had left the place under the cabin and I could see drag marks near where I had left him. About 20 feet away, I found the blanket. It was soggy wet. Kong was nowhere in sight. For the rest of the evening, I searched for him. I must have walked 20 miles at least, and this was on top of the original 8 miles. I walked to the cabin, drenched to the bone, sneezing, coughing, and calling Kong. It was of no use so I figured I may as well return to the cabin. The porch light of the cabin was on, and when I went up on the porch, I could see that the half window in the door was broken. I had locked the cabin when I left. Could Kong have broken in? The door was still locked. When I got into the cabin, there was a note on the chair in front of the fireplace. It was obviously not from Kong. It started off, You bastard. You led me to believe you were coming out to the cabin, and when I came to check on you, you were gone. I never should have trusted you in the first place. It went on from there to shorthand a list of past crimes and charges. Sally had acquired several new charges to be held against me. I couldn't imagine telling her I wasn't at the cabin because I was tracking down a Bigfoot-type creature. I cut up a cardboard box in which I had some hardware stored and made a cover for the broken window. I taped it into place with masking tape and put small tacks into each corner. With the excess cardboard, I built a fire in the fireplace and got a fine blaze going. With that, I took off my wet clothes, dried myself with a towel, and went to the bedroom to lie down. The rain still beat down, and thoughts of Kong out there, sick somewhere, and my wife home in a bad state of mind, kept me off balance. I finally did fall asleep. The agreement I made with Sally was that she would pick me up at 11 in the morning on New Year's Day, and we would have lunch together at home. This she did but with an extremely pained expression. The ride back home was not pleasant. This was the day of the bowl games, and she usually made stuffed cabbage rolls and pork. Often, we would have large crowds of people watching television with us, and we would drink beer and gorge ourselves. This year, it was just the two of us. Our personal troubles and my involvement with Kong made us shun friends. The games were the usual, and if you've seen one bowl game, you have seen them all. The only difference was the teams and the scores. Variations of pass, plunge, and punt were paraded for a total of about nine hours. We had the cabbage rolls, sauerkraut, pork, and beer, but hardly spoke. Before the first game was over, there were references to the death of Roberto Clemente, our local baseball hero. I had told my wife that I had watched the Penn State game last evening in a bar in Grindstone, a town about three miles from the cabin, and that is why I was not at the cabin when she arrived. She didn't believe this, but may have accepted it had I not made some comment on the news of the death of Clemente. She stated that it was continually broadcast the night before, and if I had spent the night in a bar watching the Penn State game, as I had claimed, it would not be news to me now. The lying bastard character within me had once again emerged victorious. What was Kong? Was he subhuman or sub-ape? Was he the missing link that anthropologists have sought since the time of Darwin? I do not know for certain, but perhaps a brief discussion of primate characteristics should be included in this report. Can it be said that primates are those animals which walk on two legs? Then we have difficulty in classifying chickens, lizards, and bears. It is probably better to leave the classifications to experts and simply discuss some of the common links between apes and humans. The class primates includes not only fossil animals, humans, apes, and monkeys, but the curious insect-eating tree shrew. Most primate groups are associated with trees and living in trees. Kong did not live in trees, but had a fascination and knowledge of them. He could climb them readily and tear off limbs and uproot small trees without difficulty. He ate many parts of many trees. If tree living is a criteria, then I am confused, since I do not live in trees. I thought about Kong and the wild black cherries evident in his crap on the one occasion I observed him. 
I believed he climbed the trees and ripped off the limbs when he wanted ripe black cherries. They are not fruits that easily fall, and the competition for them with birds would be tough. The tree-living adaptation of primates is suggested by the flexible hands and fingers and the movable feet. It is an ability to climb by grasping and holding on with flexible digits and nails. All tree-climbing creatures, other than primates, climb by digging in with claws or some other system, such as sticky oozes. Humans are about the only order of primates that have given up the safety of trees. Most mammals have eyes set on the side of their heads. These eyes, in many cases, are separated by a long snout. As primates are classified from primitive to advanced, the snout becomes smaller and the eyes move closer to the front of the head and forward vision is enhanced rather than side vision. The animals which have wide apart eyes do not have the ability to judge depth well. Therefore, they are handicapped in moving through trees where you must judge your leap and grasp at the same time. The fact that primates have accurate depth perception allows them to dive from branch to branch and judge other jumping distances as well as to estimate the distance of food on the hoof. As the snout decreases and depth perception increases, the primate suffers from a decrease in the sense of smell. Experiments have shown that higher primates not only see in stereo, but also can judge color. Kong would pick at red flecks in the weave of a knitted gray sweater that I wore. He was not able to get them since they were part of the fabric, but he would move his fingers to my sweater and then to his mouth in an attempt to eat the red flecks. When I first wore the sweater, he spent about 20 minutes doing this. As a test, I wore a similar gray sweater with yellow flecks in it. He did not seem to notice these. At least he didn't pick at them. Humans are not really very much advanced over higher primates. We don't exactly react the way chimpanzees do, but we have the same abilities of smell, sound, taste, and touch. So when I try to give Kong human characteristics, I have to back off and remember films of chimps in clothes, riding bicycles, and in some cases, displaying understandable speech. Kong was able to understand my directions, but so does my cat when she has a mind to. When moving in trees, monkeys climb along the top of the branch, while higher apes such as gorillas swing along the bottom of the branch. These same gorillas can walk along the ground on their back legs, but are usually found moving along with the aid of their hands and on their knuckles. Kong moved in a very human fashion, with a slight forward lean. His hands were much like mine, as were his feet. In this respect, he certainly was more human than ape. In the movement of his arms, Kong was superior to me or to any ape I have ever seen in life or in film. He was able to reach directly behind himself and take an apple from me at waist level. When I moved the apple up his back, he was able to reach his neck, moving his hand from his waist upward. If I had to do that, I would have to reach up over my shoulder from the front. Scratching his own back was no problem for Kong. Scratching was something he did often, usually around his waist. Kong was able to move his wrists in a much wider circle than I can. When I bend my wrist backwards, it makes an angle of about 90 degrees with my arm, and that is putting pressure on it. By grasping one hand with the other, I can force this angle to 100 degrees. I observed Kong in this motion to about 150 degrees. I have no idea how much further he could have gone had he grasped his own hand and forced it back. I tried forcing his hand back once, and we engaged in a form of Indian arm wrestle for about five minutes, and I was definitely losing the contest and was very happy to get my hand out of his before he crushed my fingers. Somewhere I had read that the highest ape functioned at a much higher level than the lowest human being. Kong, if he were an ape, could do many things with his body and mind that I could not do. If he were an ape, then certainly humans are closely related to apes. Kong was definitely not to be classified as human, although we must have had a common ancestor somewhere. Your grandfather and mine are not related, however, they descended from some similar ancestor. Millions of years ago, there was probably a primate which produced the offspring, leading to both higher apes and humans. I could not understand Kong's fear of metallic objects, and so I started to read voraciously on primate behavior. In one source by George Schaller, his experiences with gorillas were similar to mine with Kong. His books were published by the University of Chicago Press in 1963 and 1974. He states that until the gorillas were thoroughly used to him, 
He never looked at them directly in the eye, nor did he point a pair of field glasses or a camera at them in case they might have interpreted the staring eye or the eye of the camera as a threat. I thought about Kong finding his way back from the Allegheny National Forest, and what a remarkable feat that was. However, Black Bear trapped in Pennsylvania and transferred to a new location had been recorded as traveling 80 miles in two days and coming back to the location where they were trapped. A monarch butterfly tagged in Erie showed up in West Virginia the next day after a flight of over 100 miles. Perhaps the wind blew the butterfly. What I'm saying is that Kong's feat of travel would not be possible for a human, but Kong was superhuman. People who deal with gorillas usually take months of painstaking preparation in making contact, and then they must proceed with caution. To even photograph gorillas in the wild takes a team of experts. I was handicapped in being alone with an especially sensitive being, nervous with keen senses and blinding speed of movement when necessary. Kong was not a gorilla, nor was he human. If Kong had others of his kind lurking nearby, I was not aware of it. Except for the one related instance where there was no evidence of others, and even that one instance was feeling or intuition rather than fact. Primates seem to be gregarious, and the hermit primate is rare. The social behavior of baboons, chimps, and gorillas seem to be very much like that of humans. It would be safe to assume that Kong has such social relationships. However, the fact that he befriended me and the incident with the cow perhaps suggest a lack of social relationship with others of his kind. However, humans have been known to have sex with animals, and I don't want to move into that sphere of thinking. In the class of higher primates, there is dominance and submissiveness, and an individual baboon or gorilla knows where he fits in the social order. When a particularly aggressive male cannot dominate the clan because of a superior male, the second or third order male may migrate to a new clan with the intention of dominating it, or at least moving up in the social order. Perhaps Kong was on his way to a new clan, or was driven out of his old clan for some reason or other. Maybe the others of his kind could speak and he was mute. In the early years of our civilization, mutes and other cripples were driven off or left unattended as children. Was Kong a superior individual embarking on an expedition of exploration? Or was he an inferior individual driven from the tribe? Are there superior individuals of his kind lurking in the wilderness areas of North America? I believe there might be. Just as the cat catches only weak or crippled or deviant birds, humans are witnessing the slower, less cunning primates that are migrating across the continent. In experiments and observations of gorillas, it was found that they rarely fight. They will thump the ground with their hands, beat their chests, charge and stop, or throw things in the air, but only on rare occasions actually attack the person of another gorilla. The lack of physical warfare is true of all the higher primates, except humans. Since Kong was a higher primate, I was fortunate that he was passive, and if others of his kind exist, then humans that live in the wild areas are also fortunate. Assuming that his sensitivity is characteristic of his kind, then they are shy, suspicious creatures, afraid of humans, and ready to retreat. To hunt such a creature with a gun would certainly be a high crime against nature. If an animal's main method of survival in warfare is to retreat, then those best suited to retreat will survive. A pattern of survival behavior is established within groups of animals, and those that are adapted to that behavior survive the longest. In the higher primates, except humans, retreat is the method of survival. If an attack is necessary, then it is merely to delay an adversary until the clan or the individual can retreat safely. Kong's speed enabled him to survive by rapid retreat. Even though his huge size fitted him for attack, there is danger in attack, and so humans are spared hand-to-hand -hand combat. We have nothing Kong or his kind wants, and if these creatures exist in large numbers, the greatest threat to them and to us would be the destruction of the wilderness areas, especially those containing large tracts of tall timber. I do not know if Kong would fashion tools or not. He used sticks to swat the ground. He used a switch to slap his legs, but this may have been coincidental. He dug up grubs with his hands and didn't seem to need tools. I do not doubt that if there was a problem which called for the use of a rock or a club, he would have risen to solving it. From what I just observed of his way of life, tools were unnecessary. 
Perhaps in constructing his sleeping arrangements, he used tools, but what were these sleeping arrangements? Perhaps woodsmen are coming across these sleeping quarters and are not interpreting them correctly. I noticed much trampled grass and openings around the diggings, but I'm convinced that Kong was a creature of the forest and the trampled grass was not of his doing. I note once again that he certainly didn't use fire. Earlier I mentioned that I had hiked many miles in Forbes State Forest of southern Pennsylvania. On one of these hikes, I observed what seemed like a huge platform nest in a tree. It was about eight feet in diameter and made of sticks. I didn't climb up to it. The trunk was so large I probably couldn't climb the tree if I had wanted to. I just assumed it was some sort of community of crows or perhaps a bald eagle. The nest comes back to mind now. Perhaps it was built by a Kong-like creature. The evidence for others of Kong's kind is simply in the fact that, if he existed, so must others like him. There is also the evidence of the young deer and smaller animals. Where did he go with the deer if it was not to share it with others? Perhaps he was trying to buy his way back into a clan from which he had been ostracized. Sharing of a kill is typical of all primates. However, most primates, except humans, do not pursue game, and the killing of such is more of a quirk of fate rather than a planned event. Primates, except humans, do not engage in hunting expeditions. They forage for vegetation. In the realm of the arts, I wish that I had thought about playing music for Kong, say a flute or recorder if nothing else. My singing, which is very bad, had no apparent effect on him except when I got loud and he backed off. He came to the diggings clutching a piece of red dog one day. Red dog is a stone created when the clay shale from a coal mine's refuse dump is hardened after the accompanying coal in the dump catches fire by spontaneous combustion. These dumps burn for years and the sandstone, shale and bits of poor coal are turned red in the process. These dumps litter the landscape in the soft coal areas of southwestern Pennsylvania. The material is used for surfacing material on country and other secondary roads. Anyway, he had this same stone on two different occasions. It was oval shaped about three inches long and appeared to be sandstone rather than shale. He wouldn't let me handle it but kept a firm grip on it. It could have been a tool but I believe it was a lucky stone such as a child would carry. I don't know why I said a child for I have many stones around my house which serve no purpose other than decoration. Perhaps this was an insight into the artistic tastes of Kong. He either lost the stone or hid it because I saw it on two different occasions and then no more. In the social order of primates, no individual ever leaves the group for any long span of time. No individual except the human group, that is. Kong also left his clan, if he had one, for a long period of time. In this respect, he was more human than ape. When a baboon is ill or crippled, it must keep up with its roving brethren or perish. When nomadic humans are ill, they rest in camp while being nursed as the rest of the band moves on. If Kong was a member of a group, why did he choose to hang around me? What happens to the rest of the creatures if there are others, and surely there must be, after they die? After contemplating the higher primates, one must come to the conclusions that out of all of these, humans alone live on the ground. They do not need the trees for food or protection. Humans think about the past, record it, and speculate on the future. Kong did need the trees for food as well as protection. He gave no evidence of thinking about the past or the future. Somehow, in our association, though, there was evidence of anticipation in his actions. But is this a sign of thinking in the future or to some course of events? My cat asks to be let out of the house, runs to her food dish, and acts very excited when I enter the house. Was Kong's action any different than my cat's? I do not think so. Several days passed, and when I went out to look for Kong, he was not to be found. No evidence indicated his presence at any time since the new year had begun. It was disheartening. Sally had asked me to leave the house for a time for both of us to consider our relationship and whether or not we wanted a legal separation or a divorce. Now I was free to search for Kong, but he was not around. I was now living at the diggings. Each evening, I returned to the cabin, built a fire, made a scotch and water, and settled down for deep reflection on my state of affairs. I still did not have running water, and I carried water in three five-gallon plastic jugs from the spring. 
This was not all done at once, and usually only one jug a day was needed, unless I took a bath in the round zinc tub, then two jugs of water were needed. One gets to know the use of water when he has to carry it. Turning on a tap does not give an individual an appreciation of the value or nature of water. Five gallons of water weighs 40 pounds, and lugging two jugs up the hill was not an easy task, so I usually only carried one jug at a time. My toilet habits were geared such that I used the toilet at school during the day, thus I never used the outhouse that I had built. The usual night and morning urination could effectively be commenced over the porch railing. This has usually been a psychological lift to me, that is, to be able to urinate over the porch railing, to be alone in the wilderness and free from the confinements of society. It was a delayed urgency that prompted me to go to the outhouse that rainy midnight. I put on my heavy shoes, donned my jacket over my pajamas, and with umbrella and flashlight in hand, headed for the outhouse. The rain was mixed with snow, and the wetness of it sunk into me. On the path in front of the outhouse, I found Kong laying in the rain. He was dead. I stood stunned and forgot all about my urgency to use the outhouse. I must have stood there for several minutes before I tried to test his state. He was dead all right. Rigor mortis had set in. I couldn't move his arm. What to do? My first thought was that I now had evidence of his species to measure and to show to the public. The horror of the public asking me questions and invading my private life was too much for me. I returned to the cabin and got dressed. My decision was to bury Kong with the idea that I could dig him up if I ever decided to do so and needed to do so. I probably should have buried him on the property where he fell, but at that time I was not thinking as logically as I am now. I should have released him to the public, but to this day I will not discuss him with anyone personally, and even if you the reader should discover who I am, I will refuse to discuss these events with you. Just assume that this is fiction and not worth legitimate time. I tried to back the car up as close as possible to Kong, but it started to sink into the wet ground. Although it usually snows in the middle of January, it was unusually rainy that night. I decided to let the car stay on the hard, stony driveway and try to drag Kong to it. It was impossible. He was too heavy. I estimated he weighed between three and four hundred pounds. Finally, I hit upon the idea of getting the hundred-foot electric extension cord and using that as a rope, tied it to the car bumper and the end of the rope which was tied to Kong. Once I got him moving, he dragged easily over the mud surface of the outhouse path. I stopped dragging once I got his body out to the driveway. However, he was too heavy for me to lift into the station wagon. I had covered the station wagon floor with my army poncho that I had secreted from that service 20 years earlier. I knew there would be some use for it someday. Eventually, I got Kong into the back of the wagon with the aid of an old door that I used for an emergency picnic table when the regular table was full. By making an incline, I was able to pull him into the wagon with the aid of the rope turned around the front door frame. It took me almost a half hour for this process. I apologized to him as he bumped into the back seat and the tools that I had stashed there. I made a hurried count of the tools and threw a shovel on top of him and covered it all with the same blanket which I had covered him with on the first day of his illness. At least it was the first day I noticed his illness. We were off. I had once considered buying property in a place near Wimp's Gap of Chestnut Ridge, the westernmost ridge of the Allegheny Mountains. It was an area just north of the West Virginia border. Wimp's Gap was remote, and at two in the morning I was unlikely to be disturbed. I would bury Kong in this area. The ride out was lonesome, with me talking to the dead Kong and explaining that this was the best way. He did not want to be dissected and put through the meat grinders, and by the time we reached the ridge, I was probably crazy for I was convinced that I had convinced him that this was the best way. I thought about the fact that no dead creatures like him have ever been found. Perhaps I got to him before the others of his kind could gather him up. In the wilds of the Pacific Northwest, there might be wild animals that would quickly devour a carcass. There was snow in the mountains where in the lowland there was rain. Wimps Gap is on a hard road between a little town called White House on the Pennsylvania side of the border and a resort lake in West Virginia called Lake of the Woods. Although there were people living at the lake on a permanent basis, 
They did not use the Pennsylvania Road, but went out through West Virginia to a town called Clifton Mills. I had spent some time in Clifton Mills, and a hillbilly mountaineer town it was. I would never like to fight any of the rough hillbilly inhabitants of Clifton Mills. I drove over the ridge through the gap and cut the motor, drifting down the snowy road to where I could stop and do the burial. Finally, I found a nice pull-off spot, about 200 yards from the Mason-Dixon line, which was identified by a swatch cut through the big trees. I tried to drag Kong into the woods, but he was too heavy. There was only one thing to do. I took out the axe and started cutting him into movable pieces. First his head came off with one deft stroke. There was a clap of thunder and it started to rain. My feet were in snow and my head was in rain. His arms came off with difficulty. His legs needed several hacks, and by this time I was crying uncontrollably. Some blood formed on the wet snow. I took out my bottle of scotch and swilled much of it down. Then I started carrying the pieces into the woods. I have no idea how far I went, but it was a good distance. I made one trip for the arms, one each for the legs, and one for the head. I had tried to drag the torso behind me with the rope. It kept getting tangled on green briars and small saplings. The rain pelted me, the lightning flashed, and I could see West Virginia over the other hillside as I dug the grave. The pieces of Kong lay in disarray about me. Finally, the hole was about three feet deep and full of water. I dug a slit trench in the hillside to drain most of the water away. Snow was still in abundance on the ground. I went to the car for the poncho with the idea that I would wrap the body pieces in it before I buried them. When I left the car with the poncho, I found a car wheel. The West Virginia-Pennsylvania border is strewn with car parts, and a look at any hillbilly yard was no different. I took the wheel with the idea that if I ever wanted to find the grave again, all I had to do was bury the wheel with Kong and use a metal detector to find it. I did not bury the poncho, but instead threw in the parts of Kong and the wheel on top of them. His head splashing and bobbing up in the little water was ghastly, and it haunts me to this day. The covering job was a nightmare, and I was glad when it was completed. Dirt would stick to the shovel, and I would scrape it off with my foot. Putting the shovel into the dirt was difficult, and I could not get a full shovel. After the job, I repeated, I am the resurrection of the life, saith the Lord, and he who believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live, and he whoever liveth, and belief in them, me shall have everlasting life. I don't know why I said it. I'm not a religious person, but this laying to rest one of God's creatures evoked this testimony of sorts from me. I returned to the car with my shovel, my rope, and my poncho. When I got there, I finished the rest of the scotch, got in the car, threw the bottle out the window, turned the car around, and skidded up the hill to the gap and down the other side. For many years, there have been reports of large anthropoid creatures in the Himalayas. To the native human of the area, the creatures are known as Yeti, and to our wild-eyed news media as the Abominable Snowman. The largeness of these creatures are an exaggeration of the journalists, for the Tibetans who claim to have seen the Yeti say they are about four feet tall and have long light brown hair, and that they live in the rhododendron forest just below the snow line. Rhododendron is a common plant in the wild mountainous areas of Oregon and Washington, where there have been numerous sightings of Bigfoot or Sasquatch. These stories are so well documented that to pursue them here is repetition. If Kong is of this stock, then his group may have migrated here through the north woods of Canada to the areas of the Adirondacks and south over the Appalachians. Recent sightings of large creatures have corresponded to these areas thick with rhododendron and laurel. Laurel is so abundant in Pennsylvania that it is the state flower. How is it that these creatures and Kong have survived without accurate identification by humans? I am sure that there are many creatures on this earth not catalogued or found in the libraries of the world. The coelacanth fish was a recent living discovery after its fossil remains were long identified. The native fishermen of the southern coast of Africa long knew of its existence but no scientist had seen a living one up until its presentation to the world. Why are there no fossils of Yeti, Bigfoot, or Kong-like creatures? Since these beings live in the forest, it is harder to create fossils, especially animal fossils. 
To create fossils takes quick burial in a protective medium and the absence of oxygen. When I visited the Great Plains, I expected to see the area strewn with the remains of buffalo slaughtered by the army and Buffalo Bill when the government was trying to drive the Indian back to reservation living. I found no such remains, since even in that short period of time, the animal remains disappeared. My theory is that the relatives of Kong have some way of disposing of their corpses, which preclude fossil making or burial finds. On the other hand, forests create coal and there have been fossils of man-like creatures found in coal deposits of Italy. The fossil find was given the name Oreopithecus, which means mountain ape. The coal and fossils were of Miocene age. The mining operations have broken up many such fossils and loose skull and jaw parts are presently being pieced together to try to get a look at the entire creature. If we are to look for fossil remains of these creatures in North America, then I would suggest the bogs and swamps of old mountain areas. I have searched out the place where I buried the parts of Kong to see if it is still intact, but have not been able to document the exact spot. After all, it was a dark, rainy, gloomy night, and my mental state was not good. I did find a hole about three feet deep with an old car wheel beside it, but I don't think that was the spot. I wish I had my wits about me that cold, snowy, and rainy night in January. If it was the spot, then he was dug up and the body parts were removed. My superstitions concerning death are so strong that I'm apprehensive when I go back to that area south of Wimp's Gap, and I do not really wish to go back there. I must go back, and when I do, and if I find the exact spot, I will report it to the world. Another thought I had was Kong's clan knew he was there, dug him up, and disposed of his remains in their particular fashion. The days pass slowly, and I have reflected upon my association with Kong and my obligation to the scientific world. I do not wish publicity, and yet I sit upon this powder keg of knowledge. I can affirm that the creature really did exist. In the summer following my association with Kong, there were sightings of similar beings around a small town called Hutchinson in Pennsylvania not more than 30 miles from the diggings. A creature was sighted crossing a trailer court. Wild-eyed witnesses were paraded before television cameras and pictures of them appeared in print. A sighting also occurred at Crabtree and another near Mount Pleasant, both in Pennsylvania. Another man claimed a creature with red bloodshot eyes peered through his window nine feet off the ground. Television has a heyday, or is it heyday? Sensational magazines have covered the events. Creatures smelling of sulfur, flying saucer sightings, nuts and crazy people abound. What is the truth? It is difficult to sort out. I can only relate the story as it happened to me. There are so many Bigfoot sightings in western Pennsylvania that I am inclined to believe that this area is a rendezvous point for these creatures. My experiences are calm and scientific compared to those of others. I hate to mention names, but since Kong, local papers, including the widely circulated Pittsburgh Press, have mentioned them. I guess I will also. This is cowardly of me not to reveal my name, but to do so with the names of others. The most accurate description given to date was by 11-year-old Debbie Kalilo, who was walking with her father near their home in Luxor, Pennsylvania, which is in nearby Westmoreland County. It was August 1973 and they were walking around supper time when they heard something crashing through the woods. Debbie's father described the cause of the noise as a huge, hairy creature which broke small trees. The arm of the creature was two or three times the size of a man's. He told Debbie to start running. As Kalilo watched his daughter, she turned to look at her father and saw the creature behind him. The press reported that Debbie's description was that of a grade B monster movie. Little did they realize the accuracy of her description. Kalilo didn't think his daughter made anything up. Neither did he think that the arm he saw was that of a bear. Another accurate sighting was made by Chester Yothers on Labor Day, 1973. He lived in a mobile home in Whitney, also in Westmoreland County. He thought someone was messing around his garage, so he pulled back the drapes and saw this big thing standing there and later checking showed the thing to still be standing there. Chester then went to wake up his wife, and she reported seeing it also. They then called the police. 
When they got back to the window, the thing had disappeared. Yother's description was a seven or eight foot being covered with brown hair and with arms that reached to its knees. He said he didn't notice the creature breathing since he was breathing very hard himself. Rather, said Yothers, the creature probably heard him. When our local UFO and mysterious creature man, Stan Gordon, arrived on the scene and took samples of a red stain from the side of the trailer, they thought it was blood. This wouldn't surprise me, since many people of this area shoot into the darkness at all hours of the night. This fits in with Kong's habit of loving apples. I wanted to call Gordon and tell him about it, but I do want to remain anonymous. Even though Gordon keeps his informers confidential, it would make me very uneasy. Yothers didn't stay at home for a week after the sighting, and he was still afraid to go outside at nights a year later. The Pittsburgh Press states on June 1, 1975, he has taken his share of ribbing. Yothers remark was, that was no bear and it was no human being standing there. They can ridicule me all they want. I saw it. And he did, and so did Debbie Kalilo, and so did I. The news reports of creature sightings in Westmoreland County of Pennsylvania stressed the sulfur-like smell about the creatures. Speculation suggests that the creatures sleep in abandoned coal mines and the iron and sulfur smell rubs off on them. A class of junior high school students recently searched for evidences of large creatures near an abandoned coal mine near Bakerstown, Pennsylvania. They turned up some spotty evidence which resembles footprints. If these sightings and smell reports are accurate, and I have no reason to doubt them, then my experience has shown that the strong smell of the creature existed when the creature had exercised. I do not believe the coal mine theory to be accurate, since I hold with the idea that these creatures are natives of the forest, particularly rhododendron forests. It is near midnight as I finish this report, and I am in the cabin at the diggings. As I typed out that last statement, I paused and went out to the porch. I believe I saw shadows darting into the bushes. I hope I'm right. The End Afterward by the editor of the second printing, 2005. Since the first edition of this story was published, there have been many calls to Allegheny Press concerning the identity of the author, and we have kept our pledge to keep him anonymous. We will continue to do so. The reader must accept the story or reject it. Some readers have asked for information about Wimp's Gap, but we cannot provide any more than already exists in the book and on maps. The author was divorced from his wife after the publication of the first edition. He sold the diggings to another individual, and the cabin was burned to the ground by an arsonist in 1986. The ruins of the cabin are still there, as well as remnants of the pond. The property is overgrown with weeds and brush. Several very expensive houses have been built in the area, and the present owner has refused to sell to developers. There are continuous but sporadic sightings of creatures in the area and around Forbes State Forest, which is south of Laurel Caverns on Chestnut Ridge and east of Uniontown, Pennsylvania. The editor remembers, 2013. Asked a comment about a certain incident, the editor replied, When I received the manuscript of the creature, it was handwritten in pen and pencil and was on a variety of unmatched paper. Much of it was on yellow-lined tablet paper. I typed it up and made a carbon copy for the author to review. That's the way we did things in those days. When we got together, I told Mr. Clement that I thought the incident with the cow interfered with the flow of the story. If that was eliminated, as well as a couple of other paragraphs, then he might be able to sell the book to junior high and middle school libraries. He said, it happened. Then he became agitated and said this was not a kiddie literature story. It was science. He became upset when I started laughing. He was serious, so I assured him we would honor all the agreements we made concerning this work. J.T. at the Meadows, July 2013